Yeah, for speaking to me like that again. Better be wearing a cup. Baby steps. Everybody take your positions, please. Here we go. Six, five, four, three, two, rolling. Day and day Unchained. Welcome to Dave and Dave Unchained, a Van Halen podcast. I'm Dave. And I'm Dave. And we are at episode 95, Dave. We are in November of 2023, getting close to wrapping up the year. How you feeling? Doing all right. Fall is coming. I'm glad to be wearing all the sweaters, hanging out in my closet, literally. Well, let me tell you, fall is here, but oh my God, did we get lots of Van Halen news. So we're going to get right into it with Van Halen news. Van Halen news. Holy cow. It's incredible that things just keep exploding all over the place. We obviously are going to start Van Halen News with the announcement that we told you about a long time ago when I did my interview with Jason Bonham about this Van Halen themed tour that Sam is doing next summer. It's called The Best of All Worlds and it's launching on July 13th in West Palm Beach, Florida and it's going to August 31st in St. Louis with Loverboy as a special guest. Now, the interesting thing here is this is not the circle. It sort of is. It's the circle with Vic Johnson removed and guitarist Joe Satriani put in his place. So this was a wild announcement. When we spoke to Jason Bonham back in the summer, he was telling me about this tour. Remember, I was telling you he was giving me information. I was like, holy shit, that he was doing a full on tour with Sam, and it was going to be Van Halen themed, and that there was going to be a special guest involved, and I was like, oh my god, it can't be David Lee Roth, right? I mean, I can't imagine David Lee Roth is going to go on tour with Sam, and I was like, oh, that doesn't sound right. Who could the special guest be? And, of course, it's Joe Satriani. So now, the funny thing about this whole thing is, Sam flipped the script on Al, because Al was going to take Joe Satriani and go on tour with Dave and Jason Newstead, if you guys remember that whole report, and obviously, now Joe is thrown into the Van Hagar camp, and obviously, you know, he's close with those guys because of the Chickenfoot connection. Dave, it's the biggest passive aggressive middle finger to Alex Van Halen. Oh yeah. Ever. I mean, well, first of all, Sam obviously has Joe's phone number, right? That's no They're secret. They're close, yeah. Right? Of course. I mean, they've done a couple albums together, a couple tours, right? The whole chicken foot thing. By the way, I was surprised they didn't call this the Circle Foot tour, perhaps, uh-huh, yeah. or Hasab, right? Hasab, you know, Hasab you know, is great, Hasab. yeah. Sam's got to have, you know, that Cheshire cat grin from ear oh. to ear cuz he basically just called Called up Joe and said, let's do the tour. And Joe was like, all right, well, we got to do it during this time frame because I'm booked for like the next whatever year. Yeah. Because, you know, Joe's busy doing his solo thing. He's got the G3 tour. He's doing a tour with Steve Vai besides the G3 tour. Right. And it's just, you know, hey, look, Al, I just called Joe and we're doing the tour. So why can't you guys get your crap together? Because I got it done, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's really the message he's delivering without explicitly saying it. Absolutely. It's, it's brilliant. And the tour is also brilliant because he gets to do the Eddie Tribute Tour uh-huh. without calling it the Eddie Tribute yes, Tour. Yes, yes. And he doesn't get any flack right. for getting paid, for doing the tour. I mean, I got to hand it to Sam. He checked off all the boxes oh, yeah. on this one. Yeah, yeah. It was very smart, and I think it's laid out very well. I don't quite understand the lover boy thing, though. That's a little... Wait, what? Well, that's just... Look, they wanted... I won't call it marquee, but they needed a band that fits in with Sam, that people recognize the name, they know the hits, Yeah. so it helps sell tickets, right? So, and lover boy is Working for the weekend. Oh, what's the other one now? I can't remember it. Working for the weekend. Then you got the one that's that throbbing one. What's that one? Yeah, right. And I, of course, I can't remember it now. 
This is why I should write. What the down. hell is it called? Now you're going to drive me crazy. It's like that sexy sort of like throbbing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I yeah. forgot well, anyway. the damn name of the song. But anyway, the bottom line is this is huge. It's almost like he's also promoting the collection too, which just came out. And he's even saying this marks the 20th anniversary of the reunion tour that we did in 2004, because obviously the tour is going to be in 2024. So this is a pretty huge thing in the Van Halen community. Now here's the breakdown. Okay. Turn so- me loose. Turn me loose. Turn me loose. Turn me loose. I gotta do it my way. Oh, way Thank you. Oh, <laughs> oh my sorry. god I'm very thank sorry you to thank you no 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 <laughs> thank you so much for that oh god so this is the breakdown so he went on howard stern to announce this and then he went on eddie trunk so we're going to do a breakdown of all this so what he's saying he's doing and i'm going to tell you what i think the set list is going to be because listening to all the interviews and piecing it all together i think i have the set so he's saying they're going to do two hours and 20 minutes minutes which is a long show which is great i'm all for that what i would have done given his age and everything do two sets with an intermission why take lover boy out nothing against lover boy i'm just saying come out do a set of an hour and 10 take a 20 minute intermission do another hour 10 and give yourself a little breather because i mean it's pretty intense music to play he is 76 years old we forget that i mean sam is so youthful and spirited you forget he's 76 years old and He's a spry 76 years old, and he sounds great, but it's surprising. But listen, this is what I've pieced together. It looks like they're going pretty heavy on 5150. According to all the things that Sam has said in the interviews, and we'll go through all that, but I just want to start this at the top, is Love Walks In, 5150, Best of Both Worlds, Why Can't This Be Love, Summer Nights, and Good Enough. It looks like that's going to be the 5150 portion. He said he flat out he's not doing dreams. And it doesn't look like he's going to do Get Up. And I think both Get Up and Dreams are very extreme on the voice. And I think it's too hard. He actually said out, I really can't sing Dreams properly. You know, he said even when we did it live in the past, I'd have to cut corners because I have never sung like that in my life. It was like a studio thing that I did once and I almost passed out while doing it. So that's understandable. Also, Finish What You Started When It's Love, obviously classic hits. Pound Cake Right Now, classic kids humans being and now they're talking about adding in seventh seal and amsterdam from balance you know why because don't tell me what love can do and can't stop loving you are pretty high those are hard to sing so i don't think he would touch those seventh seal and amsterdam are definitely more in his range plus it adds a little fan favorites there because those are two really standout tracks now looks like they're going to continue with michael anthony doing a couple of old van halen songs now in the past he's done a talk about love panama run with the devil but mike has promised that he's going to go deep into the catalog and pull out some old chestnuts so very curious to see what he's going to do there my guess is probably somebody get me a doctor and maybe something else sam also said that they're gonna be doing his hits which means i can't drive 55 one way to rock mas tequila eagles fly your love is driving me crazy and heavy metal he also said they're going to do a mon trust tune most likely rock candy and then they're going to throw in a chicken foot song or two and you figure it looks like soap on a rope sexy little thing oh yeah big foot my kind of girl you know they might change him up from night to night he also said that they're gonna follow the format of the for unlawful carnal knowledge tour in the sense that there's going to be solos now what is satch going to do right is he going to imitate eddie solo no he's going to come out and play satch boogie which is his is tune and sam said he's going to do eagles fly acoustic he said there will be no drum solo but they will give jason bonham a drum highlight in one of the songs and mike's solo is not going to be a bass solo mike is going to take over the stage and do the couple roth songs so I think this is great. I think this sounds like it's going to be an absolute winner. The sounds of what they were making on the Stern Show, because they played live and also for Eddie, was really, really cool. Here's a little taste of them playing a mix of songs. I put together a little compilation here.
So, listen, Satch is not trying to be Eddie. He's going to be Satch, but he's going to play the Eddie songs. The interesting thing and the difference between Eddie and Satch and, oh, oh, oh no one's going to replace Eddie. We all know no one's going to replace Eddie, and Satch is not trying to replace Eddie. What he's doing is honoring the music, but doing it in his own way, which is similar to what Steve Vai did in the Eat Him and Smile Tour in 1986. So, the interesting thing here is Satch has the technological background to dissect what Eddie did in these songs. Funny thing is, is that Satch is my second favorite guitarist of all time, obviously Eddie being the first. I love this. 
I think this is incredible. I think Sam should have never broke up Chicken Foot. I mean, I know you had the situation with Chad on drums because Chad's in the Chili Peppers. The Chili Peppers have a very rigorous touring schedule and recording, and he's dedicated to them. I understand that. But I would have continued Chicken Foot with Kenny Arnoff, who definitely wanted to do that, or, you know, Jason Bonham, either way. You know, I love Chicken Foot. I think it's a very underrated band. Those two albums are phenomenal. I think they're great. Now, I'm a little bit of a bitch here, so I'm going to say it right up on the top. I'm a little bit of a bitch here. So my whole thing is I would have loved for him to forego some of his solo material and fill it in with a little more Van Halen and a little more chicken foot. But like Dave said earlier, he's teetering. You got to be careful. He doesn't want to walk around like he's claiming he's Van Halen. He addresses that in one of the interviews and we'll get to that. But I guess this sort of covers his ass in a way. So it doesn't look like he's doing a quote unquote Eddie Van Halen tribute, but he is is giving the people what they want here. Nothing against his solo songs. I love them all. It's just, we've heard that so much. And you have Joe there, and the Chicken Foot songs are great. I would love a little more Van Halen. I would love to hear, like, Dream is Over, and I would love to hear Mine All Mine, or AFU, or Cabo Wabo. You know, some of the deeper stuff. I'd love, love to hear Run Around, or In and Out, or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, I don't know if we're going to get that. But you never know. I'm curious to see if he rotates Van Halen songs in and out. Like he said in one of the interviews that Jason, Mike, and him know 30 Van Halen songs and that Joe is in the process of learning them and he's got time because his tour is not until July. But it sounds like from the clips, it sounds really, really good. So what do you make of this set list and this whole breakdown, Dave? Okay, you are so funny because you're already complaining about a set list. That hasn't started. I said I was a little bitch. Oh, I wouldn't call you a little bitch. I just find it funny. You're complaining about a set list. And the tour hasn't even started yet. I'm just like, my God, man, come on. Give the guy a break. But you're right. He does have to be careful. He's yeah. teetering. Yeah. Because remember, this tour is called the best of all worlds right, tour. Right, right, right. Right? And he's implying that it's the best of all Sam's world. Yeah. And all encompassing of Sam's career. And that's really what it's pegged at with it being heavy on the Van Halen. Yeah. You listed some Chicken Foot songs. I think the one you missed and the one they had on the poster was All Right. So I think that one will be played as well if you're trying to guess what songs they're going to play. Mm. And yet, yeah, Joe does not sound like Ed. At all. He wasn't pretty, Right. But he was, well, I wouldn't go at all. Well, but I mean, not, you know, Ed has but, a certain I mean, right. flavor, yeah. Right. He's not right. doing an but Eddie he, imitation, let's put it that way. No, no, and Sam said that in interviews. He said okay. he could have easily gotten an Eddie clone. Yeah. And that's not what he's trying to do. So I'm really glad Joe is playing it like Joe. It took him like 10, 15 years to finally come around to do that because that was always one of the big complaints about the Chicken Foot shows yes. is that those guys all came from big Fans. bands. Yeah. And two of the guys were in Van Halen and they never did any Van Halen songs. So I don't remember who had the bugaboo up their butt about that. I think it might have been Joe. But anyway, regardless, he's doing it now. So that's the really good news. I'm super psyched for this tour the logo for the tour is probably as close as you can get to a van halen logo and it does without borrow, it being right, yeah. a van halen logo yeah. and as somebody from the van halen links pointed out and dave i sent this to yes, you yes yeah it's suspiciously close to the Van Halen 2004 reunion tour logo, which was kind of heavy on the Dave era, except it had flames on the end. And that's what Sammy has now. And if you look really close at the promo poster they have for this tour, uh -huh. you can see the number half in the background. Oh, it's, wow. It's kind of subtle. It's like right in the middle, below the logo, above the band. But you could see, you know, one slash two right. for the other half. If he called this the other half, he probably would have got a lot of shit. Right, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. like I said, he is checking all the boxes. Like you said, he's keeping that balance. And I mean, as close as he can yeah. without yeah. going over. It's really brilliant. He knows exactly what he's doing. The two hour and 20 minute thing, I honestly don't know how he's going to pull that off. That's, that's way evening, longer than he's been playing. Right. So what well, we all know that Sam's math 
is suspect at best yeah. and just flat out wrong at worst. So when he says two hours and 20 minutes, is he including Loverboy in that? Because if he didn't have an opening act, then I could see the two hours and 20 minutes. Yes. And like you, I'm thinking, yes, take, take a 15, inter- 20 minute break. Yeah, they- no, exactly. But if he's got an opening band, and by the way, this isn't like the Joe Schmo rock band from around the corner. No. This is Loverboy. You can't just give him 20 minutes. No. You got to give him like 40 minutes. Right? It pro- it probably so more, just- probably more like 50 to an hour. Sometimes they do this shit where they'll start the show at like 7. Well, and this then- show is starting at 7. Yeah, okay, there you go. That means Sam's coming on at 8.30. That's what he's doing. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. But still, even with that, yeah. I'm like, man, and he's listing all these songs, and yeah. Yeah, he's probably going to rotate some because there's no way that they're going to be able to play all those songs. Yeah, it seems like gonna a lot. it's going to be heavy on the Van Halen. Tour. He promised at least 15 Van Halen Well, that's songs. interesting because he said, again, I'm going to preface this by saying yeah. it's Sammy Math time. Mm-hmm. So Sam is like, yeah, we only do about six Van Halen songs now, which is close, but not quite true. I yeah. went back and I looked at some of his more recent shows. He's been shows. doing like he eight or touring, nine. Right. He hasn't been touring a lot lately. It's anywhere between seven to nine Van Halen songs he does. And that's almost about half the show. Right. Because he does about 18 or 19 songs, depending on the night. So yeah. basically... It sounds like he's going to do three quarters of the Van Halen songs, but he's got to throw like a couple of chicken foot songs in there. Right. His ego won't allow him to do less than like three Van Halen songs. They're doing some old school Van Halen songs. Funniest part is Sam is like, I got no problem singing the Van Halen songs. And I'm like, well, I hope you're finally right about that because every tour I've ever seen you on, yeah. Van Halen or solo, you've had a problem and you only do at most like three or for Dave era Van Halen songs. Yeah, yeah. And quite frankly, I mean, nothing against Mike, but he's not a lead singer. No, he's I, not. I, he's just I, not. I'd much rather the two of them do it together. Absolutely. Sam do it. I mean, come on, Sam. It's the right time. It is. Sam. So Sam, be the hero. Finally do what you should have been doing for the past 40 plus years and sing the Dave era songs. And sing them well, and don't bring somebody on stage to sing Jump or any of that crap. Oh, and by the way, Mm. I know I'm rambling all over the place, but I do want to thank Sam for finally bringing a live keyboardist on tour with yes. them. They're bringing Joe Satriani's keyboardist, mm-hmm. who I don't know anything about him, but from what I've read, you know, he's not like some slouch guy. He's no. very good. Yeah, he's really so good. So I'm really yeah, yeah. happy to see that there will be live keyboards on stage and they're not pre-taping anything. So that's another plus mm-hmm. to see this show. And, you know, it might be the last time we get to see these guys, because yeah. you pointed out, Dave, yeah. none of these guys are getting any younger. No. Sam knows that. Yeah. He's got to do it. And believe me, if you've already gone looking for ticket prices, I know they are crazy. I mean, Dave and I are going to see these guys in Connecticut, and we're paying over $100 a seat. And that was the cheapo That's nothing. Section. That is nothing in comparison to what is out there right now. I'm doing a story on the ticket pricing for the concert scene. The concert scene tickets, and I'm sure everybody listening here has gone through this, they are really out of control. Some people were paying $600 to go see Pink. I mean, it's like ridiculous. The Harry Styles, $400. Four hundred, five hundred, six hundred dollars. The Taylor Swift tickets, forget it. Can't even touch it. Oh yeah, no, it's I know it's a lot of money. But go see it. And I know Sam is hyping this up because that's what Sam does, but I really think this could be the last, if not one of the last shots. Yeah. To like see the closest thing yeah. we will ever see to a Van Halen show. Mm-hmm. And kudos to Sam and Mike for doing what apparently nobody else who's in the Van Halen circle, pardon the pun, uh-huh. can do. Right. Well, that's also interesting. So getting into the Stern interview, Stern had him on, and Stern's a big Van Halen fan. So he kept calling it, this is a celebration of Eddie Van Halen. And they really were kind of downplaying that they really weren't like getting into that whole thing but it's funny because howard does what he normally does is he has a narrative yes and he will just ask questions yeah try and steer it towards that narrative Mm -hmm. and usually when that happens and the narrative is not true it's all the interviewee can say without being completely rude and going dude you're completely wrong that's not it at all like stop going in that direction you're full of shit what happens a lot he'll pound now they're playing all live you know sam said no one else is going to do 
that. Dave can't do my stuff. I'll do some earlier stuff. Then he also said, if Alex Van Halen or David Lee Roth wants to join us, they're welcome. Now, this reminds me of Gene Simmons when Kiss is going out on the end of the road tour. And he's like, oh, if Peter Chris or Vinny Vincent or Ace Freely want to join us on stage. Dude, you know that. You have to do that in the Gene Simmons voice. Yeah. Well, uh, Ace and Peter are always welcome. They are part of the Kiss family, and the door is always open for them to jump on stage at any point and sing rock and roll all night. Much better, thank you. It's ridiculous. It's almost insulting. Like, come on. I wouldn't even have touched that, because that's just stupid. Then he goes, oh, Wolf, Wolf has got to come out. Do you honestly think that Wolf is going to come? He's not touching this with a 10-foot pole. No, none of them are. No. But again, this is him extending the olive It's branch. also him rubbing it in Alex's face. Oh, no, that's... Oh, no, 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 that's... <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> That's very true. But this is him saying, look, if those guys want to come and jam and play, no problem. We have no problem with that. It's a celebration of the music. But what he's saying without saying is, I'm not waiting on my ass for these other three guys to get their crap together. Yeah, yeah. So if they want to come, let them come. But yeah. guess what? This train is leaving the station uh-huh. without them. So exactly. we're going. And he even invited Gary, Sharon, and everything. Gary Howard- will probably probably be the only one who shows up. Oh, absolutely. And he's friends with Sam. The other thing is, so Howard says, what are the chances of that? <laughs> At least he's honest. And he goes, well, I hope so, you know. Uh, and he goes, I've been calling Al every month for five years. I text him, I email him, and I call him. And I say the same thing that he used to say to me years ago. I leave a voicemail and a text message and an email that says, Al, give me a call. We're not getting any younger. So that was kind of interesting. He is like the jilted ex-lover who yeah. just can't let go. Yeah. Yes. Also, he said, in my heart, I don't think Al is comfortable playing with anybody but his brother, and I don't blame him. He goes, we would go out and we would jam with people, and Ed would even go and jam, but he said Alex would always stand on the side of the stage. And The weird thing is, is that Jason said that he wouldn't take the tour unless Alex was offered it first. So he was trying to be, I guess, polite in that way. He'd say, well, why don't you reach out to Alex first, see if he wants to do it. I don't want to step in here. Michael said, I have never known Alex to play with anyone but Ed, which is kind of sad. He said, but the weird part is they were really tight. But very often, he said, Roth and I would have to pull them apart because they would be physically beating the hell out of each other. And then two minutes later, they'd be hugging and kissing. He said it's a, like kind of a weird dynamic. But he said, I would love it if he would only come up and play one song with us. So that was interesting coming from Mike. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Hey, guys, just wanted to update you about some back and forth between Sammy Hagar and David Lee Roth. Well, when Sammy Hagar went on the Howard Stern show to invite both Alex Van Halen and David Lee Roth to come jump on the tour and sing some songs, he put that out there for all to hear. Then Dave responded via tweet, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. But doesn't look like Sam was so ready because in tweets and answering people back on social media, Sam said he can come out and sing a song on a show or two if he can remember the words. He's not invited on the tour. No fucking way. It was to sing a song with us somewhere like a lot of singers, guitarists, etc. are going to do on this tour. I know better than to have him on tour again. Been there, done that. Well, we'll have to see what happens going forward in Van Halen drama. We return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Now, you know, they also talked about Ed and Al hired the wrong manager, and that's what ended the band, and that's what caused all the problems, this and that. One caveat to that. Yeah. That's always what Sam says. Of course. Not for nothing, but if you do look at the history, it did look like they hired the wrong manager. I get that, but yeah. again... I know. Like, my one of my top five interviews is to interview Ray Daniels right. and just get his perspective. Oh, I'm, I am so up right? for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because remember, this is the guy who managed Rush oh, for the whole time. His whole, their whole, their whole, career, their whole right? career. So, you know, like you said, Howard has his own agenda and he kept saying, where are these cassettes where Eddie used to make for you and he would play this music and then you would start working on the music and he goes, well, Wolfie's got them all. <laughs> He 
said it right on the air, which was kind of funny. Then they started breaking down Best of Both Worlds. He said it's sort of like a little bit of Highway to Hell and a little bit of Celebration by Cool and the Gang. And if you think about it, the riff, he said it's kind of groovy and funky. He said every time I would rehearse with Ed, I'd have to come home and like really scrub myself in the shower because Ed and Al smoke so much cigarettes that I would be reeking of tobacco. And he said the lyrics came to him in the shower. He was so panicked to lose them that he jumped out of the shower, took his wife's lipstick and wrote the lyrics on the mirror in the bathroom. That's funny. (laughs) I thought that was a great story. He also said that once his manager came in there, Ed Leffler, which became Van Halen's manager, he was talking about what a bad record deal they had and how he bumped up the percentage significantly for the band. So this is where Sam keeps talking about why Van Halen with him was more successful. So now what he means by that is probably from a financial standpoint, they were making way more money and doing far better with Ed Leffler than they were in the Dave years. Even though the Dave years were very successful, they weren't making the money they should have. So he also said that a lot of people are threatened by him, Sam is saying, because he's too ambitious for some people. They get kind of overwhelmed. And he also talked about writing the lyrics for When It's Love in 35 minutes after Ed and Al picked him up at the airport. He heard the music they were working on and he instantly wrote those lyrics. But he talked about that, but he said right now was a little different. He said that took forever ever because ed was playing him the music and he kept saying oh this is like joe cocker's feeling all right and he goes i don't hear it where are you getting this from and it took until the end of the album for him and he finally clicked with it and then pulled out right now and he said it came to him when he was sitting on the beach and his wife at the time was betsy and was telling him you're going to be late you got to get to the studio and he says oh man i just want to be here right now meaning like he didn't want to leave the beach and then he wrote the lyrics and then he had the idea mike said and he said this in both interviews with eddie trunk and for howard stern that he said you don't understand what sam did with eddie's music he said eddie would hand sam like full instrumental pieces that were like wild and joe kind of backed this up he was like you don't understand like how intricate the music is that eddie would put on these albums like he said you know we all like hum along with the melodies and lyrics and stuff but there is so much nuance in these songs to pull them apart and learn them he says you can't believe and he goes and they're so unique to ed that's why sam said joe was the right guy for this job job because joe has the background of like he's like an engineer with the guitars the difference between eddie and joe is eddie is like this god-given freak of nature talent Like, he just has this music in him. He didn't even read music. He just knew how to do it inherently. Even Wolf said Ed couldn't teach him anything. It was so right there for him. Like, oh, this is how you do it. Like, yeah, you're Eddie Van Halen. No one can just do it. And he just had this natural ability to play, which is incredible. And Joe is like a talented guy in his own right. But Joe has spent so much time studying and working on the guitar and breaking it down. He's like a guitar scientist in a way. Very, very bright guy. And he's very into the guitar. Like he loves all the details and intricacies of the guitar. And he said it's like an incredible instrument because people play it so many different ways. They can play the same exact guitar and they just play it so different because everybody's hands are different and it works so differently. Well, wasn't Eddie kind of like that too in terms of how he would build guitars and take well, them apart? Well, and- they talked about that, you know, Mike was saying that he would come in and see Eddie with this beautiful, like, guitar, and he would be ripping it apart. He says, I've seen some of the most beautiful guitars, like a Gibson ES-335, and he said he would rip the pickup out and this and that. And Joe said he was doing that because less wire means more direct sound. 
And he said he wasn't just tinkering like he knew what he was doing. Joe has obviously spent a lot of time studying Ed's stuff because, and he gets into it, we'll talk about it in a minute, but he gets into how he started working on it with Alex Van Halen and Dave for their original attempt to do a tour, which is still very murky, and I'll get into that. They start talking about this. They didn't talk about it with Howard. But they talked about it with Eddie Trunk, who went right to it. So I'll give him credit for that. And we'll get into that when we talk about the Eddie Trunk thing. But let me just get back to this for a second. Sam said, right now is as good as Bridge Over Troubled Water. He said that it's that kind of quality of song. And the thing that Mike said that Sammy used to do was Ed would give him this solid piece of beautiful instrumental music. And Sam would then have to weave lyrics and a melody into it and it wasn't easy now stern said let me ask you something did eddie ever give you shit about your lyrics or a melody and he said yeah he said the song humans being was absolute torture to make and he talked about how he talked to the director of the film twister and the screenwriter and they gave him all the kind of jargon and lyrics from the movie and he incorporated them into the song and ed was like not having it like he was in a mood and he was in a way and he actually insisted that the song be called Humans Being. So the funny thing is, is that Sam said, if you listen to the lyrics on that song and the aggression of which I sing it, he said, it's all about my frustration with Ed. He said, because... I was so angry with him. You break my balls, I'll break your back. That was all coming from his back and forth with Eddie at the time, which is another interesting kind of look back at what was happening there. So that was really fucking wild to hear. So between the Stern interview and then the Trunk interview, there was a lot of interesting things that came out of it, you know? Yeah, there were decent interviews, but I am not surprised to hear Sam compare his songwriting to Paul Simon. (laughs) Or or at least the songs to Simon and Garfunkel. Of course. It's kind of like, Sam, listen, I'm not going to take anything away from you. That is a great song. Yeah. One of the best Van Hagar era songs. In fact, certainly one of the better Van Halen songs. Yeah. Period. He really spent a lot of time on the lyrics. I will never take that away from him. But come on, Sam. Slow down, Sam. Yeah. Slow down. <laughs> you don't have to go over 55 yeah. all the time. It's interesting. And he also said that Ed was different because he was an Aquarian. So he was wired differently. They also Well, st- Dave, you know you got to watch those Aquarians. <laughs> exactly. We are both Aquarians. So they went on the air and they didn't rehearse anything, which I couldn't believe. Like, how do you go on two major shows like that, promoting this tour and not work up a few weeks of rehearsal? Uh, You know, I don't know. I thought at one point Sam said we were rehearsing this yesterday or something like that. My take is that the three of them, except Joe, know these songs pretty well. And Joe was jamming with them on his own. Probably. Because the the way Joe is, he is not going to go. He's not going to free ball it. No way. Because Sam is kind of like that guy. It's like, oh, we're just going to go and wing it. Yeah, I I know. I know. Ticket foot days. And Joe was like, no. And he would be charting stuff out in the studio. The only time I really saw Joe struggle was during an impromptu introduction for Mean Street. Because that was a little rough. But other than right. that, he pulled it off. But by Joe's own admission, you know, Eddie writes tough stuff. And believe me, Joe is super talented. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I don't even think Joe is going to walk in there and play these songs for the first time in a band setting without practicing. There's just no way. Yeah. He also said, with Eddie's stuff, you're like, what is he doing here? Like, he's breaking it down. Because he said it's so specific to him that it's like 
hard to pull apart. So he also said that, listen, Sam said, the reason why this works is because we have chemistry. And this is my legacy tour. And let's go finish what we started. So that's how he ended the interview with Stern, which I that know is funny. Is the best subtitle for that tour, by the way. <laughs> I should have called uh, When the I tour heard that. that, I was like, mic drop, end of interview. <laughs> like, really, Dave, brilliant. Yeah. I don't say that about Sammy often, uh, but I was just like, this guy knows exactly what the heck he is doing. Yes. So when he went on with Eddie Trunk, which was like a day later than Stern. They, which probably bothered Eddie to no end, by the way, well, that he was the listen, second one. He's not going to compare himself to Howard Stern. I mean, come on now. I mean, that's ridiculous. Howard's like the biggest broadcaster ever. And, oh, no, no. I get right yeah. now more than ever. Oh, now yeah, more yeah. Than ever. Exactly. So now, Eddie did a good job, though. He went in and started asking some more pointed questions. Obviously, Eddie's, you know, a rock guy, so he's gonna talk on a different level than Stern. Stern's doing more broader strokes. So now, Sammy said on Trunk, we can't wait another 20 years, and I don't know how much longer I can sing this stuff. We got Jason Bonham, who plays like Al, because Al likes to play like his dad, and Jason plays like his dead so they have a similar vibe in drumming so that's great he said if we're going to go deep into the van halen catalog we need joe satriani he's the only guy who can understand what ed was doing that is the key to Satriani. He is breaking down and understanding the technique of which Ed is doing. Now, what he's doing is he's learning that and then he's doing it in his own way. He's breaking it down so he has the science of it. You know what I mean? Like, he's not just doing the overall riff. Like, he's getting the nuance, but he's not going to imitate Eddie like an Eddie clone would. He's going to play like Satch, but he's also going to do it right. Right. Like he's going to do it with the proper chords and modulations and everything. Sam said, this music needs to be supported in order to live on and serve, you know, young people and stuff like that. That it, statement, by the way, yeah. is a little insulting to Vic Johnson. Well, he gets been into that. that stuff yeah. for the better part of 20 years. Yeah. And to be fair, again, Sam did not hire an Eddie clone right. at all. That's not no. why he hired no, Vic. No, 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 no. Vic is a very good guitarist. Yeah. Underrated at times. Yes. You know, he's not like a superstar guitarist, no. but gets the job done and better than most. But whatever Sam would say, and he said this more than once, oh, you need a guy like Joe to really play it. I get where he's coming from, but it's kind of like, Sam, if you really meant that, you would have gotten Joe or somebody else to play this Sam stuff. But you did. You had Vic all these years and he pulled it off. So it's kind of like, eh, Sam, I hear what you're saying, but your own actions don't really back that up. But, like, let's be honest, though. It's not like Joe Satriani was going to follow Sam around the way Vic oh, does. Oh, no, I get that. I get that. Yeah. But, you know, it's not like Sam did not play any Van Halen songs at all because Vic couldn't handle it. Right. When it was the Dave and Sam tour, the Sans Halen tour, right? It was nicknamed. That so, fucking uh, name was... Was like the world's greatest heavyweight, you know, whatever. Like, that was like round for round yeah. or something like that. Yeah, anyway, pound whatever. for pound or whatever. Yeah, was or whatever it was. But he did a lot of Van Halen on that tour, obviously. Mm. And he toured with Vic and it wasn't a problem then. So I get how he's like really promoting and pushing Joe for the tour. And I get all that. And I get why. But I just roll my eyes whenever he says that because I'm like, come on, Sam. We both know that's not quite 100 percent true. Yeah, that's true. So now, Sam said, obviously, Joe is the right guy for Alex to say he's going to come in here. But what happened was Eddie asked Joe, why are you doing this? Which was a great question. And he said, well, to be honest, it was all about playing with these guys. He goes, that was the main thing. He goes, that chicken foot might not come together, and this is a way for us to play. And I knew there would be a great connection. He said, but I didn't want to pass up doing a summer tour with these guys. He said, it's too good to pass up. So I thought that was an honest answer, and I thought that was great and direct from Joe. And then Eddie said, let's get back to what happened with Alex and Dave. Obviously, this is almost like you flipping the script a little bit. 
And so Joe said, well, getting the call from Alex was out of left field. I had never met him before. And when he and Dave got on the phone to talk to me about the tour, part of me said yes. And part of me said, don't do it. You know, I called him a few times and said, you know what? I don't know if I can do this. And he also said the idea that Mike wasn't going to be a part of it kind of bugged me. So that was interesting. Then Mike comes in and this blurred the lines a little bit. He said, oh, I also got a call from Dave and Alex and, you know, Irving. Azov got a hold of me when Ed was still alive and obviously that never came to play but wait a second it's like Mike you weren't involved in the Joe Satriani thing like he started like blurring the lines well no I thought there was some talk that he had initially been approached for that somehow the whole thing is smudgy but I thought that they had originally approached Mike or they had originally approached Sam and Sam was like yeah I'll do it but I'm not doing it without Mike and then they were like, we're not freaking dealing with that. So <laughs> let's pull up Casey there, Newstead and see yeah. if we can get another bass player. I kind of thought that I, was how it was unraveling. But again, or very, I thought I thought it was like where, where they asked Mike, and then Mike was like, "Well, what about Sam?" I don't know. It was well, yeah, the whole thing is smudgy. But I don't think Mike is like saying something that was out of school. I mean, if anybody is giving it an accurate depiction of what happened, I would say it's Mike. I mean, admittedly, when it comes to Sam, I'm just going to be blunt about this. I think sometimes he's so far up Sam's butt that sometimes the loyalty gets in the way of the truth. Yeah. But usually, yeah. you know, he's pretty spot on. He's covering in terms up of what's going he's on. He's covering up for his boss is what he's doing. Hey, listen, I really think that both Dave and Al do not want to deal with Sam at all. And then Mike is tied to Sam and Mike's not about to give up what he has with Sam to go running off with Dave and Alex because that's rickety at best. And this is why Wolf is like, I am out. I don't want anything to do with Van Halen because... Oh, I totally get yeah. Wolf's point of view. I mean, this is just like a whole bunch of BS and It's a drama. pain in the and he's, ass. And he's like, you know what? You guys may be so used to this. Yeah. But me, no, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to do my own album, play with my own band, and do it the right yeah, way. Yeah, leave me because alone. The one th- <laughs> right, because I think the one takeaway that Wolf got from Van Halen is what not to do yeah. when you have a band. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now Sam said that obviously Joe is the right guy. Oh, Alex wanted him, so obviously Joe's the right guy. And to me, there's no other choice. He goes, we'll play five or six Van Halen songs with Vic. And he goes, that's all good. But when I started saying like, oh, we might play 15, it's like, whoa. And he says, well, Vic's going to lay back for this one and we're going to go out with Joe. So he kind of like smoothed that over real quick. I don't know. I hope Vic's not crying somewhere. But listen, the bottom line is I think you do need joe for something like this and especially what Vic is doing. not surprised yeah no. Vic is not surprised. Yeah, i think he's a good player sure right, yeah. he's probably still on retainer oh yeah exactly so now this is the interesting part so sam says he's talked very delicately here we've been fishing in that van halen pond for a long time without trying to be van halen i'm sammy hagar he says i've been treading water on that so people don't think we're trying to be van halen there's oh always haters out there you gotta be careful and then he also talked about that it makes sense to have jason because alex was always searching for that bottom sound joe can play the eddie stuff and he knows how to break it all down and while still keeping in the iconic licks and he says we feel confident that we can do the van halen stuff as good as it can possibly be done today and joe said the first time i heard eddie play i heard eruption come on the radio and i was ready to kind of jam along with the radio and I was so happy to hear that someone reimagining the guitar and had this incredible attack and I was like wow this is incredible it was exciting he said that you know like after Hendrix and Joe is a hardcore Hendrix guy that he could see someone come along and reinvent the guitar the way he did now he also said that there was a lot of room that Ed left in songs for improv in the live scene that they would have kind of the basic song but there was a lot of room in there and that he said after studying a lot of live clips of Ed, he says, you know, Sam, Ed was not doing the same thing over night after night. He was putting a lot of nuance and intricate stuff in there, and even Sam didn't even realize that. So Joe said, listen, I had a similar situation. He said, in 1988, I played with Mick Jagger, and I really wanted to play with Mick Jagger, but I said, I know I'm not even the right guy for this gig. But he said to Mick, you know, I'm coming after all these iconic guitarists with these songs. He goes, how do you want me to do this? 
this. He goes, listen, Mick said, go out there. And he goes, and just get into the song and do what you would have done with the song. So I'm thinking about doing that in the same vein, that I'm going to approach it that way, which I think is smart. He said that Van Halen, that the Van Halen song is, every Van Halen song is built on Eddie's architecture. And then you have Alex's heavy groove and Mike's huge bass with his background vocals. And he goes, and Sam obviously had to weave into Eddie's madness. And he said that if you think about what he did and if you break down what he did, he actually makes it very hard for the singer, regardless of who the singer is, to get in there and do their thing. Because his music is so intricate and so deep and so thick. And then Mike said, to be honest with you, he said you could have all of those songs and release them all as instrumentals he says because they were all so rich with bar chords and melodies and stuff like that but he said that you know sam really had his work cut out for him when it came to working with eddie's stuff now sam said one of the biggest and most requested songs on his website is summer nights and this is where sam made a big full pop and i'll explain it he said summer nights is a song we could never play and he goes we only played it halfway through the 5150 tour and then never played it again because it's a difficult song to play. Now, that is not true, and I'll tell you why. They played it the whole 5150 tour, number one. Number two, they played it as the opener of the Monsters of Rock tour in 88, and they played it on the OUA12 tour. So I don't know what the hell he's talking about. And he's played that solo, too. I mean, not consistently or regularly, Yeah, yeah. but I remember there was one tour there where he was saying oh this is a very tough song to play but you know Vic figured it out and they played it I know so yeah I was thinking the same thing you were Dave I was like I don't think that's quite correct no but again no. it's Sammy Matt Sammy Matt so then he said Joe plays it and he doesn't use the transition thing that Ed does I think he calls it a trans tram or something he does it without it he figured out I guess a way around it but then he played the song and then he goes Mike and I haven't played that song since 5150. And I was like, wow, that is dead wrong. I don't know, man. He's got his own fucking agenda going on. Then he said, we will ask David Lee Roth whatever song he can remember will play. Eddie Trunk was like, well, you know, you say you're going to invite people up. He said, oh, we're going to have guest singers on this tour. We're going to have guest people come up. You know, in different cities, we'll have different people come up and sing songs. And then Eddie's like, well, will David Lee Roth be invited to come up? And he says, well, he goes, we'll ask him, and whatever song he can remember, we'll play. And he goes, and from the oh, bottom. Oh, such a dig. Such I, a dig. I, unbelievable. And then he says, from the bottom of my heart, he's welcome as well as Alex, Gary, and Wolf. And, oh, Wolf has got to be there. It's <sighs> mandatory. Wolf, you got to be there. Meanwhile, I can imagine Wolf looking to, like, a, like a series of drunk uncles that show up at like Thanksgiving oh, I know. dinner. He's like, oh, we're going to pull people. And we all know how well that did not work. <laughs> No. For jump no. back in '86. Oh. Well, he's I, talking I think that's about yeah. just Sam's way of backing out of the question. Exactly. Or, no, it's his way of being like, oh yeah, of course. Oh yeah, Alex and Dave and Gary and Wolf. Oh, they're all invited. It, it's no different than what Gene did. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he heard what Gene did and be like, mm, I'm using that line. I mean, honest <laughs> to God. I mean, Gene is uh, yeah, Gene right. is now Gene yes. is now playing his last couple of Kiss shows at the Garden, and Rolling Stone was like. Seriously, is Ace and Peter even like possibly showing up? And he's like, well, you know, uh, doors always open. Uh, uh, you know, Ace and uh, and Peter are are part of the family, and Kiss is a family, and sometimes you have dysfunctional family members. Meanwhile, like Ace has been sober for like fifteen years, and so the answer is no. Yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> you just yeah. can't. Ace say is the like, you can go no. fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right exactly exactly it's kind of like, just yeah. admit that you're not proactively sending them an invitation yeah just admit it. gene can go scratch you with a broken bottle <laughs> So he said that they haven't rehearsed yet. They haven't even gotten into rehearsal. Now, the interesting thing was Joe said, I have spent my career avoiding Eddie's stuff. And I'll tell you why. He says, I listened to it as a fan. But he said, I was very afraid that his style would seep into my own stuff. So I stayed away. But he goes, two years ago, I sat down and I tried figuring it out because of the Dave and Alex thing. 
And he says, I was facing what I was avoiding. And he says, but Dave and Al, he said, weren't looking for a clone. They were looking for someone who knew where the music was and pull it out and why it was created to like understand the music. And then Sam said, that's exactly what he was looking for as well. Then Eddie said, by the way, Joe, are you going to play Eruption? And Joe said, you know what? I don't think it really translates for this show because it's Sammy era, but I know how to play it and I might sneak it in a little bit somewhere so that's sort of interesting and he goes any chance of you playing it now and he goes no <laughs> i thought it was funny. awesome yeah it was awesome. That's great well no but i agree that that's probably the best way to do it is to interpolate it into another song yeah like he just said he's gonna do quick, a little taste like quick yeah, and yeah. dirty insert it yeah. in there get it out and just as like an homage yeah like an homage yeah and then they played pound cake a little bit So then, you know, on the song, the line says, you take an average guy who can't identify or whatever, right? So Eddie points out, he goes, let me ask you something, Sam. Every time you sing that song, you take an average guy, you point to Mike. And he goes, why do you do that? And Mike goes, he's been doing that shit for over 20 years. <laughs> That is funny. Wow, that's a sharp eye by Eddie. And then Mike goes, well, I guess I am an average guy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was so funny. So then Sam said, listen, we're doing like 2830 cities. I'm not really going to do more than that. He says, I'll never go out and do what I can't do. I'll never half-ass it. And that's why I'm not playing Dreams in the set. He says, because it doesn't make sense for me to do so. Because this is basically, we're flip-flopping our set. Normally I do five or six Van Halen songs and the rest of the set would be my stuff. He says, now we're flip-flopping it and we're going heavy on Van Halen to keep the music alive and really serve the songs. And then it closed out with Sexy Little Thing, a Chicken Foot song. Every time I hear Chicken Foot, I'm like, oh man, Sam fucked that up. There's a lot of people in the same boat as you with that. And not even Sam fans who are like, yeah, I, I couldn't give two craps about Sam's solo career, yeah. but are really big fans of Chicken Foot and we're sorry to see that band go. Yeah, no, you know what it was? It just wasn't. The second album didn't sell. That was it. And Sam couldn't be bothered. That's what it was. I guess so. But it's kind of upsetting. And I don't know. And I think the other thing is like getting the four of those guys in the same room at the same time with their schedules. Is yeah. Not so. Yeah. Sam also went on the Rock of Nations podcast and he talked about the lack of an Eddie Van Halen tribute. He said, I'm so disappointed how they've handled everything, including when I left the band and what they they did the dysfunction in that band when i was in the band the first nine years we got along great like freaking brothers and we were happy to be together one big family things went wrong drugs alcohol are a bad thing when it turns ugly and it just never been the same for them not to have done something for eddie van halen the greatest guitar player in the world on the planet greatest musician i'm telling you it is ugly but it is not my job then he said mike and i are doing our thing i don't know how much longer i I can sing the Van Halen songs and sing my own songs and jump around on stage and do a great performance. But as long as I can do it, I'm going to keep doing it. And I think we'll just keep adding more Van Halen songs to the set because we're serving the Van Halen stuff up pretty good these days. That was a little precursor to the announcement. Also want to let you guys know about David Lee Roth dropping another song from the California Sessions, this one called High Fashion Girl. And it is interesting. It's an acoustic tune with some beautiful guitar work by John Five. It's got a little tropical throwaway vibe to it. Here is a clip. She's my high fashion girl. She's my high fashion girl. Chicago 41 Maxwell Street. Tonight we feature flavor of the week. Make that horn good speak Make my warm 
interesting thing is it opens with lyrics taken from the 1964 Beatles song, Do You Want to Know a Secret? He says, you'll never know how much I really love you. You'll never know how much I really care. So that's a little nod there. It has a retro vibe and talks about this high maintenance girl and there's some reference to some fashion icons like Coco Chanel and Yves Saint Laurent and Christian Dior. And what did you think of this song, Dave? Well, he's coming out with these songs at a pretty fast clip. Yeah, I know. I mean, this is like, I think the second song he's come out in about a month or something like that. Right. 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 Because normally it takes him about, you know, at least like four months or so to come out with these things. So I'm wondering why the pickup on this. The song itself is pretty good. It's not bad. I like listening to these songs together. I think they work better together as an album and a listening experience as opposed to a one off. I mean, again, it's not bad. It's all decent. But I find like if I just want something to listen to that's like kind of sort of mellow without like being completely sleepy, it's good stuff. Because like, like how many songs does he have out now? Is he up to seven? It's like from, seven or eight or something. I mean, seven or eight. Right? It, we're yeah, getting so. close to the whole thing happening. I'm still surprised he hasn't released Alligator Pants. Yeah, yeah. I really thought that was going to be the next one because yeah. he's got yeah. it on that online comic yeah. book. Yeah. So I thought for sure at the rate he's going, it's got to come out sooner or later. Yeah, absolutely. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Believe it or not, David Lee Roth released another song from the California Sessions, Wash and Fold. Here's a clip. I feel like the pancake when the syrup hits In my cardboard palace where the slumdog lives TV dinner from the bottom shelf Great big glass of nothing else Million stories in the city This one's getting old worth of moving hold Hey, like the sign says watch and fold Hey, like the sign says watch and fold We'll have to see what happens moving forward if this whole album is going to come out but the songs are coming fast and furious We're now up to number 9 and I think there's only 12 in the album. We'll have to see. We return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Also wanted to let you guys know, I mentioned this as an insert in the last Van Halen News, but Dave and I didn't get a chance to talk about it, which is Eddie Trunk interviewing Wolfgang Van Halen on his show Trunk Nation, and he addressed the issue of a different kind of truth not being made available on streaming. When Eddie asked him directly, Wolf said the contract ran out on putting it up on streaming services. So we've been working on getting it back, but there are some people involved who do not like that record and are not making it easy to get it back up. So when Eddie started saying, well, might that person commonly be known by three initials, meaning David Lee Roth, Wolf said, probably, I mean, yeah, you can put it together. I hate to say it because people will think I'm making stuff up, but it's like, man, I'd love to have that record back up there, but he doesn't like it and he's not working with us to get it back up there. So... I hope people who like it have a physical version of it. I think that is really strange. You also said in regards to this whole, you know, Van Halen thing and why things are so difficult. He says, I think throughout my time in Van Halen, you'll learn things that you want to do and you want to apply. And then you learn things that you don't want to apply. And I think that's why I've been so excited to do Mammoth and to have something from its inception be something pure where you can talk about things and there are not really any big challenges other than weathering the storm together instead of the storm being dealing with each other. You know what I'm saying? So, obviously, Wolf is burnt on this, but here's the thing. I don't think this is exactly true, and I'm not saying Wolf is lying. I just don't think that Dave hates the album. I think this is a financial contract dispute. It smells of that. I'm not saying Wolf is lying or anything like that. I'm just saying there has to be something else going on there than Dave doesn't like the album. And it sounds like they need him to sign off on it and he's holding off on signing off on it. 
And the reason most likely being is probably financial. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's like an end of a sentence missing there. Yeah, there's Wolf something saying, missing. Dave doesn't like the album. Okay, but the part that's missing is Dave doesn't like the album because, like why? Because he doesn't like how it turned out? That's one thing. He doesn't like it because he doesn't like the way he's getting paid from it? That's something else entirely. So I think you're on to something because I really have a hard time with that. Or maybe did Dave not like it because it didn't go platinum or it didn't do well? No. Because I've also heard rumblings that the reason the DLR band album mm. isn't out there is the same thing, that Dave was disappointed in the album. But what does that mean? Does that mean Dave was disappointed in the way the album came out or the way the album performed? Because the album did not sell that well at all. And was he embarrassed by that? And that's why it's not out there. So I agree with you. I don't think Wolf is lying, but I don't think the whole yeah. truth is out there either. And if you could ever get a straight answer from Dave, I think he would tell a similar but somewhat different story. This is, as with most things, Van Halen, and in life for that matter, is a case of the truth is somewhere in the middle. But whatever the truth is, it's just sad because I know there are some differences of opinions on this album, but it's certainly at the least a decent album. Dave and I like it a oh, lot. Love it. But still, it's like you're leaving money on the table. I don't know. Maybe Dave is like, we're not getting paid enough. I don't know. I really don't know. But either way, all I'm saying is I implore to everybody who's responsible for getting this album to stream. Please, guys, get it out there. It's a high-quality album, and you owe it to your bandmate to get it out there on a streaming platform. It's like the old days where the album would be out of print. Yeah. It's embarrassing. It is. I'm sure the issue has something to do with it was on Interscope and not Warner Brothers, but come on, I'm guys. telling you. Just there's, get yeah. it together and get it done, please. It's all we're asking for as fans. We just want to go into our YouTube music or Spotify or Pandora or whatever streaming platform we use and just click on the album and play it. It's all we're asking. It's really not that hard. It's so sloppy not to have it available. Now, listen, if Dave wants to dick around with a DLR band album, that's an independent album that he owns, that he created, that was his record, co all that shit, that's all fine and good. And I'm not saying he shouldn't. I think he should put it up on streaming. But if he wants to dick around with that, that's his business. However, this is ridiculous. I mean, this is a major, major band that has an album that is being left off the table. And the bottom line is, it exists either way. It's not like it doesn't exist. I mean, you can go on YouTube and hear the whole goddamn thing because people post it all the time. And people own the physical copy of it. But it's ridiculous that it's not available in a catalog of a band as major as Van Halen. That is insane. So, listen, that's got to be fixed. And I'm sure it probably involves lawyers and getting all that done. It's probably an expense and all this shit. And they're probably like, ah, oh, who the fuck wants to deal with it? And they're probably just letting it lie. But I just don't understand. I mean, it was on streaming for years. And then it gets pulled? I think he's holding that hostage because of some money issue. And I don't even think the money issue has to do with the album. It probably has to do with something else. And he's like, well, you don't do that, then I'm not going to sign off on the streaming rights for a different kind of truth. I don't know. This or he probably told him, yeah, I don't like that album, so we're not streaming it. And so Wolf can say with a straight face, yeah, that's yeah. the reason. But, you know, with Dave, there's never a straightforward reason for anything. So I yeah, think I know. you're right, and there's something more to it than that. Yeah, for sure. Wolf also was on the cover of Spin Magazine, believe it or not. Big article on him called The Rising Sun. There's a quote in here that was interesting. He says, I know Dad taught himself, and I wanted to follow the same way. It was important that I develop my own skills and my own sound. That's helped me, or else you'd be listening to some shitty Van Halen cover band. He says even when he wanted to help, he just didn't know how to teach. Like, those who can do, can't 
teach. So I thought that was an interesting line. The rest of the stuff in there is pretty much the stuff we've already talked about, so I don't want to go through all that. But check that out. It's a really well done story by Daniel Cohen. Yeah, that yeah. was a really good story, yeah. by the way. It was really well written and yeah. well done. Worth reading for sure. Sure. And Wolf is also going to be opening for Slash from March 28th to April 29th, and he's playing in Ireland, the UK, Denmark, France, Czechoslovakia, all part of the River is Rising tour, which Slash is doing. So that is all happening. And also one of let you know that I saw Wolf last night on his solo headlining tour at the Starland Ballroom in Sayreville, New Jersey, which is where John Bon Jovi is from, by the way. And he did an unbelievable set. Really good. He opened up with Wright, which was incredible. His voice sounded amazing. You can tell the band has really spent a lot of time on the road because they've gelled incredibly. He came back with Mammoth, and then he stopped the show, and he looked around and he said this might be the biggest headlining show we've ever done it's a really interesting club it is the widest club i've ever seen where is this at it's in sarahville new jersey it's the starland ballroom he also played a lot of new songs miles above me which had this really cool breakdown in there which was really kind of fun they also played it like a pastime which had like a real kind of cool metal ending to it that he added optimist which was really kind of a heavy vibe with melody mixed in there. He played Stone which was a nice centerpiece of the set. I'm alright. Also you could check out some of these clips on the Instagram that we have. He played Epiphany which really never sounded as good as it did live. It was really unbelievable. He said this is my dad's favorite song. He played Think It Over. Then he did an acoustic version of Distance followed by Waiting which he said was a sequel to Distance and then he closed out the set with You're to Blame, Feel and Take a Bow which was really Really wild and really came back strong on the encores where he said, I don't even know why we do that. It's dumb. He says, we leave the stage and, you know, come back. He said, that's showbiz, though. And then he came back really hard with another celebration at the end of the world and then closed out with Don't Back Down. And he said, this is easily the most intense show we've ever played. So he was having a blast, playing like a wild animal, really getting strong in the live scene. So they are playing all over the place. And Nita Strauss. So- what would you say the age group was for the audience? That's that an interesting show? thing. Well, you and I are right in the heart of it for sure. There was tons of VH shirts everywhere, and it was older demo for sure. You know, interesting. There, yeah, it was. I would say if I had to say an age range, I would say thirty-eight to sixty-two. About that. I mean, okay. listen, it's so clear that Van Halen fans are certainly following him. Now, also want to let you guys know, Sammy Hagar is auctioning off one of his very famous cars. Barrett Jackson, which is the world's greatest car collection auctioneer, will hold an auction for the highly desirable, one-of-a-kind 2015 Ferrari called La Ferrari, which is owned by Sammy Hagar. And I don't know why he's getting rid of it, but I guess he says here they're doing the auction January 20th to the 28th at Westworld in Scottsdale. And he says here that the La Ferrari is kind to be on the auction block Saturday, January 27th. Said La Ferrari is one of the most prized vehicles in the eyes of the collector world, said Craig Jackson from Barrett Jackson. And Sammy has been a longtime part of our family, dating back to when he first sold his Shelby GT500 during our 2006 Scottsdale auction. The Ferrari La Ferrari, which is simply known as La Ferrari, was introduced in 2013 as the Italian automaker's definitive model. It was an instant sensation blending breathtaking aesthetics with cutting edge technology and jaw dropping performance. It's a hybrid powertrain with Formula One inspired features and the LaFerrari quickly earned its place amongst the most sought after vehicles in the world. It was custom designed by Hagar and this LaFerrari features an elegant cream exterior matching the color of the 1960s Ferrari that Hagar saw pictured on the wall at the Manarello factory during his visit in 2014 and it's further enhanced by a carbon filter and black accents and Sammy said this is undoubtedly my favorite car I've ever owned and it is an incredible machine and I've adored it since I took delivery
delivery of it in 2015, but the time has come to pass it on to someone else who will hopefully enjoy it as much as I have. It's a priceless vehicle that is true to the essence of Ferrari, a marquee I've loved for a long time. I look forward to being there when it crosses the auction block in January, and together with Craig and the Barrett-Jackson team, we're going to make it a party for the ages. So, interesting. Sammy's selling off houses, selling off cars. I don't know what's going on, Dave. So are we placing a bid on this? No. Let me tell you something. If I was the wealthiest man in the world, I wouldn't own one of those cars. Those things are nothing but trouble. They're very expensive. They're hard to maintain. They're like very high maintenance. It's not worth the money. I can't fit in a Ferrari either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need a truck. I'm sorry to laugh, but I was not expecting that. No, that's all right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> also, wrapping up Van Halen news is Billy Corrigan of the Smashing Pumpkins joined Sammy Hagar in the circle on stage to play Ain't Talking About Love. This came out during a surprise jam when he played at Hammond, Indiana. And here's a clip of that. So I'm wondering if this is a little vision of what's to come for the Sammy tour coming up this summer. If people like Billy, huge rock star in his own right with the Smashing Pumpkins, is going to jump on stage with Sam and do a few songs. I wonder if this is going to be a trend. What do you think? That'd be nice. Didn't Billy interview Ed back in the day? Yes. I think we talked about that in right? one of our... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it was yeah. like so, in the 90s, I mean, like around cool. balance. That, if Sam's move that people can come up and jam, you know, kind of like a Cabo thing thing yeah it's true like i'm all for that yeah yeah all for that. i mean i just think that would be awesome and if it happens you know each show you know whoever's in town or whatever that would be cool that'd be totally great. cool yeah well that wraps up van halen news and that's the way it is good night and we are on to our interview with songwriter extraordinaire Desmond Child. This was a fantastic interview. Desmond Child is known for working with some of the biggest rock bands in the world and has had huge hits with Bon Jovi and Kiss and Aerosmith and Joan Jett and all kinds of people. So now where's the Van Halen tie? Well, he has a very intricate story that he met with David Lee Roth and also met with Van Halen and he was supposed to work with them but things went awry. But this is a really interesting interview and I'm sure if you guys are fans of Van Halen, you are also fans of the other bands I just mentioned. He's got some great insight into stories about working with all of these different outfits and wow, he was a really cool guest, fun guy. But before that happens... We got plenty of mail to get through that Dave needs to start working on. And I know he wasn't happy about it. We're up to 16 letters. So we were happy to hear your voices. And that is all coming up next. Take a listen. My Van Halen stuff was I was going to my first party in seventh grade. Got out of the car. Somebody dropped us off. A mother dropped me and my three friends off. We were walking. I didn't know this kid's house. It was like at middle school. And all of a sudden, you were around strangers. And I remember walking up the street and hearing an atomic punk going. And I was going, holy cow, what is this? And me and my friends were looking at each other like, what is this? And that was the first Van Halen moment. And man, when I found out David Lee Roth was a Jew, boy, that made me happy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> If you need a dose of VH, get a taste of the closest thing. Romeo Delight, the ultimate Van Halen tribute band. Playing all the hits from the David Lee Robb era. First classic six albums plus deep cuts. Some of which have never been played live before by the band. They even throw in popular tracks from the Sammy Hagar era and solo hits. The most viewed Van Halen tribute band on YouTube. Romeo Delight. Doing customized recreations of staging instruments and costumes from the classic Van Halen era. They even perform entire Van Halen albums in sequence. Romeo Delight plays theaters, casinos, summer indoor and outdoor festivals, and special events. They're also available for private parties. To contact them, call Bud Blanche at 215-704-5144. That's 215-704-5144. 
or via email at sonicparade1 at yahoo.com. Romeo Delight, the ultimate Van Halen tribute band. The long-awaited Van Halen book from legendary rock journalist Steve Rosen is here. Tone Chaser, Understanding Edward, my 26-year journey with Edward Van Halen. This is an over 400-page odyssey of Rosen's decades interviewing and being friends with the late guitar god, Eddie Van Halen. Rosen says, I spent 14 long, hard months writing Tone Chaser. It was both the most difficult story I've ever written and the most rewarding. I wanted to be honest and transparent as I possibly could, which was not always an easy thing to do. In the end, this was the most complete and comprehensive book I could have possibly written. There was nothing left to say when I reached the last page. With every word I wrote, I was reminded of the time I spent with Edward, and that hurt terribly. But it also brought back what a remarkable experience that was, and how insanely lucky I had been to have ever known him, and astonishingly, to have been friends with him. I hope you can feel everything I felt. That is the purpose of this book. Pre-sales are currently going on now for the self-published book. PayPal Steve directly at scrosen at sbcglobal.net. That's scrosen at sbcglobal.net. It's $47 for those who are buying it inside the U.S., and that includes shipping. $95 for those who are buying it overseas, and that includes shipping. Tone Chaser. Understanding Edward, my 26-year journey with Edward Van Halen. Don't miss out. Order it today. Pick up the new book, Eruption, Conversations with Eddie Van Halen, by Brad Tolinsky and Chris Gill. These music journalists share with fans, new and old alike, a candid, compulsively readable and definitive oral history of the most influential rock guitarist since Jimi Hendrix. It is based on more than 50 hours of unreleased interviews they recorded with Eddie Van Halen over the years, most of them conducted at the legendary 5150 Studios at Ed's home in Los Angeles. The heart of Eruption is drawn from these intimate and wide-ranging talks, as well as conversations with family, friends, and colleagues. In addition to discussing his greatest triumphs as a groundbreaking musician, including an unprecedented dive into Van Halen's masterpiece 1984, the book also takes an unflinching look at Edward's early struggles as a young Dutch immigrant unable to speak the English language, which resulted in lifelong issues with social anxiety and substance abuse. Eruption, Conversations with Eddie Van Halen, also examines his brilliance who changed the face of guitar manufacturing. Eruption, Conversations with Eddie Van Halen. Get your copy today on Amazon.com. Hi, this is Joe Satriani, and you're listening to Dave and Dave Unchained. Author Greg Renoff is back with a new book, Ted Templeman, a platinum producer's life and music. The new biography of the record producer Ted Templeman, who went on to produce Van Halen, the Doobie Brothers, Van Morrison, Aerosmith, Sammy Hagar, and more. The book, which runs 1995, and it's currently available at Amazon.com. From the man who brought you Van Halen Rising comes Ted Templeman, a platinum producer's life and music, written by Templeman, as told to Greg Renoff. Available for only 19.95 at Amazon.com. Order it today. Take a trip to the rock conscious of the 80s in this new full-color 300-page book, Pictures Alive. Filled with never-before-seen photos. Go back and see the mighty Van Halen at their peak from two amazing concerts in 1982 and 1984. Plus photos from Sammy Hagar and David Lee Roth's solo tours and many other bands of the day. Filled with amazing photos, classic stories, original ticket stubs, and more. If you're a fan of Van Halen, you will not be disappointed. Hit the ground running with Pictures Alive, the new book. Now available at picturesalive.net. That's picturesalive.net. P I C T U R E S A L I V E.net. Get it today. Pick up the new coffee table size book, The Decade That Rocked, by legendary rock photographer Mark Weissguy Weiss. 
This 376 page book has hundreds and hundreds of full color photos that Weiss shot through the 80s for magazines like Circus, Faces, and Hit Parader featuring bands like Van Halen, Motley Crue, Twisted Sister, Bon Jovi, Skid Row, Guns N' Roses, Ozzy Osbourne, and more. There's even behind-the-scenes stories to go with these colorful, eye-popping pictures. The Decade That Rocked, a new book by rock photographer Mark Weiss, is available for purchase now. Go to thedecadethatrocked.com, where there are exclusive bundles available with extra prints, t-shirts, and even patches. Inquire about the Van Halen bundle, especially made for Dave and Dave Unchained listeners. Order today. The decade that rocked. It'll rock your world. Well, I like to think that Van Halen has completely changed the face of modern music as we know it. And I'd like, I'd, I'll explain that because it sounds preposterous initially. Is that there's a huge faction of people who try and mimic Van Halen, copy and play lickety split like Edward does, or they try and get the Alex Van Halen drum sound and that sort of thing. And the other faction of individuals, musicians, which is much larger, of course, are so revolted by Van Halen music and the way I do interviews and et cetera, et cetera, that they're forced to come up with some very substantial alternatives, musically speaking, and that's where New Wave comes from. All right, Dave, you know what time it is. Dave and Dave's mailbag is big and round Dave says he's tired can't lift it off the ground <laughs> wants a light bag likes those the best yeah, and he likes the short mail better than the rest and he said well I think that you're headed for a whole lot of letters <laughs> well I think that you're headed for a whole lot of letters well I think that you're headed for a boat That's right, it's mailbag time again. And we have a sweet 16 batch here. We're going to get to it. Letter number one coming from your brother from Tehran, Iran, Dave. Simiak Solaju. And he has a lot to say, so we had to trim it down a little bit. He gets into the subject, what we talked about the last time he wrote in, which is the translation of the Japanese lyrics for the Van Halen albums where the lyrics were changed. So he says, about my previous email in short, Apparently, there was a woman transcriber in Japan named Linda Henrik who were freelancers for Warner Brothers Japan. She was mailed from Warner Brothers USA, just a cassette dubbed from master tape with no album cover, lino notes, no context at all. Just an anonymous tape that she listens to that and then writes down the lyrics she hears. Then she sends it to the printing unit and then they translate them to Japanese lyrics for the booklet. Then they print them and send it to retailers in the stores for CDs and cassette packages. As I understood, there was a lack of English speakers around Linda, so there is a lack of correction and filling dots in the lyrics. In the end, Linda was paid by the quantity of work, so she was trying to increase her salary like every human being by working cassette by cassette from artists and lyrics by lyrics because it was weird like in the atomic punk lyrics. Nobody walks these streets at night but me instead of rules. I said it was weird because it's easy to hear the word rules in that part of the song and I mean it's a human mistake not a governmental thing it was lazy in my eyes but I understand it's hard to hear some of the words in the lyrics but changing it it's unfair to the artist because the meaning and the lyric effects would change what do you think your loyal fan Simiak Soluju Terani Run okay I can't believe that this is the process that is used for this task it seems rather primitive but 
who knows, this is another country and they're translating U.S. stuff. And if you ever see books or movies, it always gets weird when they start translating from the U.S. stuff. She probably doesn't even care. She's probably banging it out. So it seems more worker-based than governmental restriction. What do you think, Dave? I think you're right. That's an interesting process of how that works. Yeah. So thank you for the background on that. But yeah, it's someone who doesn't care. It's interesting because by now with an established artist, the lyrics are out there. I mean, they're published somewhere. Right. I mean, somewhere in the Warner archives are the official lyrics. So they would just take those. I mean, if somebody is translating from Japanese and then back to English, I could see how that could be an issue. Mm -hmm. But that would be a strange way to do it. So interesting story. And, and thank you. For the background but yeah some funky things going on with some of those foreign pressings letter number two comes from casey alfred known as han since many strings had to be pulled by warner brothers to get sammy and his perm from geffen into van halen how come ted templeman a warner executive was able to jump labels and produce for geffen he did this for other artists as well did warners make money off of hagar's voa just curious if you guys have any idea how this part of the record companies work also is it frankenstrat or frankenstein the names seem to be interchanged frequently it was eddie's modified strats one moniker and any other brands of guitar he modified all steins cheers hun casey alfred okay ted is a producer which is separate from an artist who is more like a product so like van halen to warner brothers was like cheerios to general mills right they were like a product as part of their company but the producers work project to project and part of ted's contract as an executive might be that he can continue working in his producer career on the side now in terms of the Frankenstrat and Frankenstein, I've heard it called both, but Wolf says Frankenstein, plus I believe it was in the Smithsonian as Frankenstein, so I'm going to go with that. What do you think, Dave? That's a good question. I forgot that it was referred to as both, so I'm not sure what the line in the sand is in terms of what it's called or what it's not. I just thought Frankenstrat was another alternative term for the Frankenstein. Yeah, I thought it was too, yeah. And I'm pretty sure that Warner did not make any money off of Sammy Hagar's no, VOA. No, no. Why would it? I think Why? you're right. I think Ted Templeman just sold his producer role for hire and the artist would hire him as a producer. Yeah, producers aren't like tied to a label. You know, well, some labels have like house producers. Yeah, they do. They do. You know, like, right, right, right. Especially like back in the day. Right. But I think in this case, Ted was just a producer. And in that role, you know, and the artist would hire the producer and it just so happened that Ted was also an executive at Warner Brothers. But I don't think he was tied down to just produce Warner Brother label people. Yeah. I'm sure that was definitely preferred. Right. Which he did. He did a lot of them. But I think he also did some other stuff on the side. Letter number three comes from Shannon the Dude. And he sent us a clip, which is really interesting. This is a clip of David Lee Roth singing finish what you started now it's not real dave it's ai dave but this is a very interesting clip here's a clip of this take a listen And then he simply says, what if? So I thought this was really wild. I could see David Lee Roth doing that song. I think that's one of the few Sammy songs that he could sing. It's kind of creepy, though, because, you know, it's like a fake version of Dave. And I wonder if as AI becomes more and more part of our society, if people are going to start doing this, where they're going to take, like, Van Hagar material and start putting Dave's voice on it to see, oh, let's get the David Lee Roth version of 5150 or something like that. The problem is Dave singing Sam's lyrics, and that doesn't come off right. It just doesn't flow. We just saw the Beatles do it, right, Dave, with Now and Then? They did a whole kind of AI thing, which, again, just doesn't come off right. It comes off very very plastic. What do you think? Actually, I just 
saw an article that said, even though they used a lot of technology for that song, yeah. they did not use AI. Giles Martin said explicitly, I thought about it, but I did not use AI. They did use the technology to lift John Lennon's vocal from the cassette tape and make it its own track which I don't think is AI per se. But, I mean, either way, the technology is out there, whether it's AI or not, to do all sorts of crazy things. Yeah. And, Dave, like you suggested, it is coming. Absolutely. Yeah. There and, will be, and I'm shocked we haven't heard him yet beyond yeah. this song, Right. that there will be people doing what-ifs of Dave doing Sammy songs and Sammy doing Dave songs. Now, this particular example, quite frankly, I think, is not that good. I think it's a poor reflection of AI mm. because to me, it sounds more like Gary Sharon singing the song <laughs> than it does David yeah. Lee Roth. Yeah, that's true. At least to these ears. But Dave, you are on the right path. And I think I've sent you stuff in the past. I'll give you a great example. You know, I'm a monkeys fan, yes, right? Of course. People are taking backing tracks to songs they know exist and they know the lyrics to the song. And they are using AI to get the voice of the artist to sing the song, even though the artist never sang the song. Yeah. And I've heard two examples of that so far with monkey songs. Wow. And they're pretty darn good. I mean, they're not perfect. You could definitely tell they're not perfect. But it's like, wow. Like Holy Grail songs, like, you know, they were out there, but the tape was erased or whatever. And people right. are recreating them. Right. It's happening now. <laughs> the future is now. And wow. what will be happening are people recreating lost tracks that never happened or making, you know, the lost Van Halen album we never got. Or Dave, somebody's going to try and recreate in the midnight hour so we can finally hear it. I mean, <laughs> it's going to happen. Oh, and my God. Very soon. I just don't understand how it works, because how can a computer sing like David Lee Roth? I'll give you an example. So they did this with Mike Nesmith, right? Right. And they wanted him to sing a song. The Monkees had started a song. They didn't finish it. The song had been performed by somebody else. So the lyrics were known. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you feed in a bunch of songs that Mike Nesmith has sang on. So the computer learns what Mike Nesmith sings like. Oh. And so then you put in the lyrics to the song and the melody to the song and how the song was sang by somebody else. It's crazy, but this is how smart it is. It learns to sing like Michael Nesmith and sings the song. It's crazy, but that's why it's artificial intelligence. That's where we are right now. It's creepy as fuck. It is. Dave, pretty soon you're going to have to take a breath and ask yourself before you hear something, is this real or is this AI? Right. That's true. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. And Molly Crew is going to be coming out with albums left and right. <laughs> All well, well, Dave, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, right now we have ways where artists can make their voices sound Auto -tune, better. Auto-tune, yeah. You know, like on the new Rolling Stones album. I mean, Keith Richards sounds great on the one song he sings. And I'm like, all right, something funky is happening there. Because <laughs> he hasn't sounded that good. Yeah. In like 30 years. I mean, I know the guy gave up smoking, yeah. but come on now. You know, auto-tune helps a lot mm -hmm. with that, oh, yeah. but that only gets you so far before it starts sounding artificial. That album is well-produced. It's a well-produced <laughs> album, yeah. Oh, it is. I'm not taking that away. It's well done, but, yeah. you know, Mick Jagger's 80. There yeah. was definitely some technology oh, I'm sure. helping him out there. I'm sure. No doubt. I'm sure. Like I said, there's all sorts of technology out there. It may not be AI per se but it's out there it's being used and you know if they're using all sorts of backing tracks and concert you won't even know anymore like is it live or is it memorex it's getting very tough now you know the eddie trunk in me comes out and says is it really a live show probably not so much He's right, but now more than ever. I mean, he's been singing that song for like at least ten years, probably longer. But it's not. Uh, it's, but he, now, his whole thing more is, than ever. Yeah, yeah. he's got a valid point. But his thing is not AI. I mean, his thing is backing tracks. I mean, people like. Oh know. yeah, here's what comes next. Like we've had holograms. Like there's a whole thing about holograms. You know, Frank Zappa hologram. Yeah, yeah. Or what's his name? The guy who sings Holy Diver. Dio. Ronnie James Dio. There was a hologram with him. Now, are we going to have holograms? 
of artists performing songs that they didn't even come out with the first time and we're using AI to recreate songs? Mm. I mean, is that where it's going to be? Well, at that point, it becomes a video game. I mean, it's like ridiculous. Well, yeah, but, you know, the people are hungry enough. I'm curious to see, and I was just talking to someone about this, if we start having live shows where you can pay 20 bucks to watch it on your TV. Like, you know, we all know pay-per-view, but I'm talking about like a regular tour. Like right now, U2 is playing the Sphere in Las Vegas and people are paying the exorbitant amount of money to go to that show. But if someone says, you know what? I, I want to see that. I'm not going to go to Vegas and start spending money at a hotel and a flight and go through God knows how much those tickets are. But I'll pay 20 bucks and watch it on my flat screen. Like, I wonder if we're going to get to that. I mean, we have some of that already, but I'm talking about like a regular, oh, I want to see The Offspring. Oh, I want to see The Smashing Pumpkins. Or like you just start punching in to anybody's tour and you pay whatever fee and you watch the show. Like, I'm curious if we get to that because if that is a new way of making money and then they host less live shows, it makes them not have to travel as much. I don't know. I'm curious to see where it goes. On the one hand, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet after the pandemic. Yeah. But on the other hand, they won't do that because I think they'd be afraid that a lot of people are going to want to do that and not go to the show. Because as we were just talking about offline before we started the podcast, getting to certain locations is a pain in the butt. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, you jump through hoops to do this, that, and the other thing to see a live show. Right. Now you just pay 20 bucks, watch it on your phone, Mm -hmm. you're done. But that takes away from the concert revenue. And are you going to sell out a show now by doing that? Maybe you don't. Right, right. And Ticketmaster and Live Nation, which are effectively one and the same, they own all these venues. Right. If people stop going to venues, now you've got some serious revenue streams that aren't earning revenue anymore. You're not selling the T-shirt anymore. You're not selling beer anymore. You're not charging for parking anymore. All this stuff. Yeah. So I think that's the reason why there hasn't been a lot of that. Now, maybe for somebody like Taylor Swift, you can get away with it because she'll sell out the shows and you can still charge 20 bucks for people to watch her remotely and they'll do it. Yeah. But I don't think you do that for every show. Yeah, that's no, true. And she just did it with that movie. I mean, she came out with a movie. She made like over $150 million after going out on tour and doing a whole stadium tour. And then she had it not even streamed. It was that was like a movie. It was like a production. So she had that professionally filmed and edited and everything and then put on the big screen and people spent a lot of money to go see it. So I don't know. These things are crazy. I mean, it really is nuts. They sell tickets with all kinds of merch attached to it and everything. Letter number four comes from Chris Pianelli from Staten Island. He says, back when Adam Sandler and Chris Farley were on SNL, they did a fake commercial for Schmidt's Gay Beer. Adam and Chris had a summer rental with an empty pool. Magically, they opened up Schmidt's Gay and it transformed into an all-male pool party. The fake commercial originally used guitar riffs from the Beautiful Girls song that Van Halen did and backing vocals as well. Sadly, it was later changed to a Van Halen-ish guitar lick, which totally ruined the skit, as it is now shown on YouTube. It's probably a copyright infringement issue, which forced NBC and SNL to change the music. Chris Pianelli from Staten Island. Yes, Chris. I love that skit. I thought that was so funny. I mean, Chris and Sandler were so hysterical in that because what they do is they open the Schmitz Gay and then they just fall right into it and they're like playing around with all the guys. It was really hysterical. But the funny part was the Van Halen music, right? I mean, which was also funny because the song is called Beautiful Girls and it ended up being like a whole thing with guys. It wasn't derogatory toward gay guys, though, either. It was making fun of them the most and it was really kind of hysterical. But it is funny that it was replaced. I mean, that was on national television. So I would imagine they would have had to clear that in order to put it on TV. But maybe they only cleared it for the night. And then they couldn't once YouTube came out. Because that came out way before YouTube even existed. So maybe when it went to YouTube, they had to transfer it. So that happens a lot. It's a funny story. This is so stupid. I'm only Our listeners will appreciate it. So there's two TV shows. Back in the day when we all were buying DVDs and shit like that, right? 
right? So there were two TV shows that never came out on DVD. They ended up finally coming out, but took a long time to come out on DVD and a long time to come to streaming because of music issues. So there's two of them. One is Beverly Hills 90210. The other one is WKRP in Cincinnati. The original shows had all of this music, and I mean a ton of music. They had to re-edit every episode with different music because of legal copy issues. And it was insane that WKRP was a radio station. That's kind of the basis for the show that worked around like a classic rock station, that kind of thing. And it was a workplace comedy, but there was so much music in it that they had to replace so many different little pieces. That's number one. Number two, Beverly Hills 90210, if you remember, they used to have artists on that show who would perform and they would feature their new song that was coming out on their album. They had sound tracks to that tv show all kinds of stuff all of that had to be replaced and it was nuts and fans were clamoring for the show to come out on dvd back in the day and then also on streaming it was the delay because they had to re-edit every single episode with new music there was a movie too it was something like pretty in pink or one of those movies they had to re-edit the movie with all different music because they couldn't get the rights was Fast Times, I think, was another one. There's still a problem with fucking Fast Times on streaming. It's so funny. You can't get the soundtrack to Fast Times on streaming. I think I mentioned this before in the podcast, is that a fan has taken the time to rebuild the soundtrack through a playlist by getting the songs from various parts of different albums. It was hysterical. It's funny. You see a lot of that shit out there. In fact, if you look on Spotify, there's a lot of soundtracks you can't get because of copyright issues. There's too many people and too many different labels or whatever. I don't know. A lot of issues there. Great example with WKRP. If you weren't going to bring that up, I was. Yeah, yeah. Because some episodes don't quite flow the same. Yeah, no. And especially with that Saturday Night Live skit, the music is such an integral part of the skit. Totally. That to replace it, it loses something. Like part of the joke is gone. Yeah. When you replace it. And you're right. There's something going on there. Okay, they could get the rights for the initial broadcast. But back in the day, no one was thinking about putting these things on DVD, never mind streaming. No, yeah. So now you've got to like renegotiate that all over again. Or if the contract is silent, then you can't use it. Like you said, it's a huge pain in the butt. And you got to go back and the show suffers for it. So it's kind of sad, actually. I get everybody wants to be paid for their work. And I'm not suggesting they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But I just don't understand why you can't pay the artist the same for the initial broadcast as you did for any other broadcast afterwards and whether it's streaming or dvd you know just pay them but yeah, you know, what can i tell you everything has to be a challenge it is so. always letter number five comes from mario aguilera the third from joliet he says as we all know today is the third anniversary of ed's passing i'll try to make this short when i heard ed had passed i got quiet At work, someone asked if I was okay because I was starting to process. Here's this man I never met, but I knew him through music and live shows. I actually shed some tears. That's never happened to me before, not even when Prince passed. I think it's because Van Halen was one of the first bands that grabbed me. Thanks to the 1984 album and MTV constantly playing Jump, I was only nine years old. I think there's something to be said about your formative years. It's what stays with you the longest. Ed has always been my favorite guitarist and my favorite member of Van Halen. I wish he was still here and we could still be talking about the next Van Halen album and tour on the Dave and Dave podcast. Hell, I wish Ed was here just so he could live his life and watch wolf kick ass like he's doing now anyway happy trails dave and dave mario aguilera the third from joliet well of course we just passed ed's third anniversary of his passing and yeah it really still stings and it's had a strong effect on many people curious though now this is interesting If Ed was alive and well, the question is, where would the band be? Most likely, Wolf would have left to go solo. Would Michael Anthony be back in the band? Would the band even be together? The other question is, would they have ever done that Sam and Dave tour? Would that have ever happened? It's kind of a strange thought. You wonder, like, what really would have happened regardless of Ed's health, say he was fine? I don't know if they would have done another album with David Lee Roth because, obviously, a different kind of truth 
was a different kind of pain in the ass for them. So what do you think, Dave? Well, you know I'm not crazy about playing the what if. I know, I know. They had tried to make another album with Dave, and they couldn't. Did they try? So they go, well, I think Ed wanted to. He, I know he didn't wanted make that to. that comment like he wanted to, you know, but all that Dave listens to is dance music. He was frustrated, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the Kitchen Sink Tour, I mean, again, I think that was just an idea that Wolf was throwing around with his dad. Mm-hmm. There were never any concrete plans for that. I think a reunion tour with Mike was in the works. So if Ed's health hadn't taken a turn for the yeah, worse, yeah. that would have happened. And that I mean, might have been the transfer, meaning like sure, Wolf sure. would have opened up and then maybe Mike moves into the band. I mean, you just don't know. It didn't seem like they were bringing Sam into that fold. We talked about this extensively. No, no, they weren't. Yeah. But that would have been the next logical step. Yeah, would oh, be yeah. To do a tour with Dave and Sam. Every promoter I mean, wanted that in the world. Good luck getting that to happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially talking Dave into that oh no Oof. i mean after sam did that tour with dave he was like i'll never do that again but let's face facts put the right amount of money in front of sam and he'll do it i mean dave too to a point but i think dave's ego was so big is that oh i don't think he would go for that but i mean we'll never know i tell you though if you remember correctly from what we have spoken about in the past of van halen news sammy is scheduled to do a tour this summer And he's talking about, you remember the interview I did with Jason Bonham? Talking about doing a ton of Van Halen. This is the plan. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. With surprise guests. And remember, Dave can perform live like in spurts. Like, I don't know if he can carry a show anymore. Who knows? Maybe he's invited on that show to come out and sing five songs. I mean, you never know. I wouldn't put it past anybody. Are you kidding me? The shit that has gone on, you think this one's never getting back with this one, this one's never getting back with this one. Everybody gets back, please, because the money talks and these damn promoters will do anything and everything to get everybody back on the road. That's true, but I don't think Dave's going to give Sam the satisfaction of showing up at a Sam show. And I think when Sam says in special guests, I mean, that guy's Rolodex, he knows everybody. So, you know, it could be somebody like Kenny Chesney coming out for all we know. I'm not holding my breath for any former member of Van Halen showing up at Sam's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mitch Malloy. Right. I mean, we know Mikey will be there. Well, of course. You know, he might have Gary come out. That's right. But aside from that, Sammy needs, I, Sammy I mean, needs look, someone never to say never, but I'm not holding my breath on Dave. Sammy needs someone to cut the limes. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. All right. Letter number six comes from Peter Legoman from Exeter, United Kingdom. He says, When Wolfgang talks about himself being the real tribute to Ed, it's just not the same thing, and Wolf is confusing the public and private. His playing a tribute to his dad at the Taylor Hawkins concert, slipping it under the radar at another musician's tribute show, is the equivalent of Van Halen supporting Bon Jovi in 1995. It's yet another example of the Van Halen camp having zero Zero fucking clue about how to respect the band's legacy. On an entirely unrelated matter, I used to think that Sammy disrespected Van Halen fans. He had a low opinion of us based on stereotypes when he joined the band by writing such blatantly awful sexual lyrics. It was like that was all he thought we needed. Lately, though, I'm beginning to think that maybe he just didn't know and was capable of any better. What do you think? Love the show so far. Keep it up. Peter Legoman from Exeter, United Kingdom. Well, number one, Wolf's tribute at the Taylor Hawkins show was not equivalent to Van Halen opening for Bon Jovi. That was such an insane, stupid business mistake. I mean, that was just unbelievable from a management standpoint to put Van Halen as the opening act for Bon Jovi. And I realize how big Bon Jovi is overseas and they were way bigger than Van Halen was. I understand that. But I'm just saying it's not worth the way it looks. It just looks so bad. I don't care what the money or exposure, it's not worth it. I don't think it equates. The reason Wolf did that is simply because of the dysfunction in the band. It allowed him to play with other musicians that he loved 
who loved Van Halen, and he did it for Taylor, who loved Van Halen, and he was able to do it his way, the way he wanted it, and in front of the world. Big viewership, on his own terms, and without dealing with any members of the band, meaning Alex, meaning Dave, meaning Mike, not that Mike was a problem, or Sammy. Plus, it appears... There was some family breakdown going on. There is a lot of hush-hush about what happened with the David Lee Roth, Jason Newstead, Alex Van Halen, Joe Satriani situation. There's something that went down. I don't know what it is, but there's just a vibe and something that was going on between them. That's number one. Number two, I can't imagine that Sam is purposely dumbing down his lyrics so Van Halen fans can digest them. That's insane. However, I will say this. All his crazy sexual lyrics are mainly Van Halen songs. Spanked, Pleasure Dome, Pound Cake, Source of Infection, Up for Breakfast, Good Enough, all those different types of songs. You don't have as many in his solo career. If you think about it, there, I mean, a little, little dick in the dirt, but that was not so much a sexual thing as more of a, like a domination thing, but it was different things, but not to the level of the stuff in Van Halen. So I don't know. Did he really think that? I mean, it's not like Dave did that. It's not like Dave was writhing with sexually charged lyrics. I mean, you know, obviously he had some things, little peaks here and there, but he never was so blatant as the cherries on bananas, you know, but I don't know. What do you think, Dave? Well, Dave had a certain flaw. Flair. Yeah. He was never as explicit as Sam was. Sam never wrote any lyrics to say, hey, I'm insulting the fan base. I mean, he never conscientiously thought that. I think he just didn't know any better, and he just wrote whatever came to him for a song. I could see how a fan could interpret it that way and say, oh, this is really insulting. But that was just Sam's style of writing. Right, absolutely. And letter number seven. Oh, can you feel that, Dave? There's a disturbance in the force. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird! It's a plane! It's Midwest fucking Ron! That's right, it's Midwest fucking Ron! He is back! And he was having some email issues, so he's backed up and he's got a lot of things to say. Number one, he says Sam's explanation as to why they didn't do videos for 5150, he sent us some quotes from Sam and from Eddie talking about how they didn't have time. Both of them said they didn't have time to make a video for 5150, and that was the reasoning behind it. And he also said when you guys discuss Sammy's upcoming Walk of Fame star in Van Halen, news back in june it'll be fun to hear who you think is paying for it it cost seventy five thousand dollars also in june he said you're forgetting that there were two shows in tokyo in february 1989 the february 2nd show not the one the video was from was where the mine all mine intro was from and he says that was in response to the mine all mine discussion regarding van halen right here right now vinyl release earlier this year so midwest fucking ron he's back kicking ass as typical so number one the no videos thing ron i totally believe what both say Sam and Ed said in those quotes is BS. I totally think it was done on purpose to not copy Roth to go in the opposite direction. Roth was so identified with the videos for 1984 that there's no way they're going to be able to duplicate the success of that. So just drop it, to drop it completely. The thing that really blows my mind about it is considering the time, the 1986 time. I mean, having a video was so instrumental in promoting your album it was almost suicide not to have one when 5150 first came out it was very underplayed it wasn't hugely trumpeted the way some albums are kind of came out quietly it wasn't a huge ordeal and then when it started to really pick up with success then they started promoting it more so i think you know warner brothers was a little leery not that they didn't think it had quality but you know how the fans were going to react to it what do you think dave so i also think that's a bs excuse because there is no way that any record company especially warner's in 1986 is not going to allow time 
for a video. Right. Now, I know Van Halen was coming down to the wire with this album because, you know, they kept on messing with it. Record company finally had to say, guys, we need this album now. You're going on tour. Like, they had to get ready for the tour. Yeah. They had to finish the album. Mm. You know, they had done some shows before the album had come out. Right. If I'm remembering that. Yeah, yeah. Correctly. But the fact they were like, oh, well, we just ran out of time. Like, there's no way the record yeah. company would not have been like, guys, we're spending a week on video or whatever yeah, so yeah. i'm sure that's their official tagline yeah yeah but i think they just told the record company we're not doing videos and the record company told them well you're crazy but somehow they got away with it and the other excuse was we want people to come see us live like if you want to see us come see us live it's like wait what it was, okay yeah but yeah. again this is 1986 right this is an established model for getting your music yeah to the man Yeah. And everybody was doing it. You want to do that old school? Okay, no problem. I mean, good luck to you. And again, they pulled it off. But I mean, the answer is right in front of you and they're ignoring. it. Again, I think you're right. The videos were so associated with David Lee Roth that they just did not want that association at all. Absolutely. And like you always say, Dave, it's like a miracle that they pulled this off. It really is. And if you think about all the little things that they had stacked against them, they really got away with murder, like going out on tour, hardly playing any old Van Halen songs. That was insane. Going hard negative on Dave, trashing Dave. Dave. The funny thing was is what they did was MTV was so hungry to do something video wise on them. Obviously they did the Blue Angels thing for Dreams which became a very popular video and my question is what would have happened had they had videos? Could that album gone diamond or even more? I mean you don't know. That's the interesting part. What they were though as I was saying before they were so hungry that they did a special documentary which by the way i think is phenomenal to this day i still think that is a phenomenal documentary which is van halen unleashed which you can see on youtube it's basically got interviews it's like a tour documentary of the 5150 tour you got sound checks live clips interviews backstage all kinds of stuff in fact to this day I'm going to say that is the most behind-the-scenes Van Halen thing that's ever been released. Although it really hasn't been released officially, but it came out on MTV. And they did an hour-long special. And they sent a road crew out with Van Halen throughout the summer of 1986. And I'm not sure exactly when that came out. I don't know if they did it. Maybe it came out in the summer and they went with them in the early part of the tour or something like that. But it was interesting. If you guys had have not seen that that is essential viewing you gotta see that that is a really well documented it's the first time i ever heard eddie speak which is funny because i never even knew what his voice sounded like and i was trying to figure out it's the first time i ever saw him speak because he was always quiet and david wouldn't shut the fuck up so it was always dave talking to the press but that was the one time i saw eddie doing that now also we wanted to talk about who's paying for sammy's walk of fame i'm sure sammy paid for that those things are paid for by the artist or sometimes the artist fans do it they like raise money for it but in this particular case i'm sure sammy foot that bill what do you think if it was for sam i'm sure he paid the bill oh yeah if something like that was for van halen Mm -hmm. i'm sure they would not foot the bill (laughs) and that would be something that the fans paid right (laughs) of course and also he talked about the tokyo shows we didn't forget about those but i know what you're saying february 2nd show that's where that intro comes from you remember you said you love that mine all mine intro remember that you said you love that long intro from mine all mine yes yeah that's where that apparently comes from anyway so so a little taste of Midwest Ron. He's back on the scene. So we're going to be hearing more from him in the future, which is always welcome. Letter number eight comes from Jason Simmons. And he says here, everybody keeps going on and on about a tribute concert for Eddie. And everybody has all these cool ideas that probably will never come to fruition. I'm just here to throw in one more idea out there. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if a bunch of different Van Halen tribute bands got together and did a Battle of the Bands Van Halen style? If anybody famous wants to be part of it, they're more than welcome to be part of it. Like I said, just an idea I thought I'd throw your way. Kind of my contribution to the pod. And one more thing. 
it. I know Dave hates what ifs, but what if Dave liked what ifs? <laughs> I thought that was funny. Jason Simmons. Okay, Jason. Well, you're quite a comedian. I think that's a great idea, to be honest. The problem is all those Van Halen tribute bands are all over the country. You got some on the West Coast, some on the East Coast, and some in the middle of the country. So you'd have to kind of gather them all together and then let them all duke it out. Or, you know what, the other idea you could do is do an all-star version and take, like, the best Dave, the best Mike, the best Sammy, the best Alex, and the Bex Ed and make an all-star team and then do a show with those guys from the different tribute bands. What do you think? I like that idea. Yeah. I don't know if band chemistry will make it work or not. Yeah, well, no, the same but the material. Battle of the Bands, that's a great idea. I don't know that I've ever seen that before. Yeah. So that could be very interesting. You know, we'd have to get our buddy, buddy on the phone, <laughs> right? That's right. And then you get Jim Bombas a call, right? Yeah. We got to get all these guys. Buddy's going. you're one step away from a monkey, Dave. I know. I know. Literally. <laughs> Literally. Literally. Buddy's brother-in-law is Mickey right. Dolan's. Mickey Dolan's, right. Exactly. Which is absolutely but that, crazy. But honestly, that idea, even if it was pulled off, is still probably the closest we'll get to a tribute show. But I think it'd be a good idea. You know, you get like some Van Halen and some Van Hagar bands in there. I mean, that would be a fun night. It's right. Dave and Dave Unchained presents the Eddie Van Halen tribute everybody wanted. There we go. See, we wouldn't have to sing, Dave, because, you know, we could be the host for the night. Yeah. Introducing bands. Right. Oh, I'm sure Eddie Trunk would stick his nose in somehow. That's fine. <laughs> I have no problem whoring out our show with his name, you know, Eddie Trunk hosting. Well, we'd have to pay all the bands. But since it's a tribute show, yeah. we'd have to give the money to charity. We have to give it to and, the uh, Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation. Right. Ex- I was just going to say that. Yeah. Exactly. So all the money would go to that. Yeah, right. That's true. That's Eddie's favorite charity. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. But I'm sure he'd be calling it Trunk Unchained. <laughs> Because he's got to put trunk in front of everything. But that's fine. But then part of the deal is, okay, but we get to go on your show and we get to talk to you. (laughs) <laughs> and we get to make fun of you for like an hour of <laughs> yeah. all the things that drive us crazy. I'm sure. If you let us do that, you can market the show any way you want. That's, That's fine. Right. That's right. He'd probably agree to that. <laughs> 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 I mean, logistically, oh boy, I think I have to take off work for that one. Like, you know, when we used to have our anniversary show, that was just with one band. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine getting like a dozen bands <laughs> and logistically making that happen. Oh my God, you have no I idea. Mean, it can be done. Yeah. It can be done. But I think I'd call Bob Gelb up and say, how do we do this? Because that's, right. uh, that's, you know, that's <laughs> that's, that's a lot of work. Exactly. You got to call in the big guns like Bob Gelb. Up. He's the guy to do it. Right. He yes. would definitely be the yes. right guy. Letter number nine comes from Fran Galanti. And he's Fran the Man from Kiss Room House Band. And he says, I think the reason Alan Barry's documentary got taken down is because you guys are so popular in the Van Halen community that... That as soon as he was on the show, everyone knew about it. And that's when the powers that be found out and made him take it down. On to the Sammy remasters. I definitely hear more clarity and punch. And I think Al's drums benefit the most from this. I'm surprised the overall volume of the tracks aren't in line with the recently remastered albums. And last but not least, you guys are getting close to 100 episodes. I hope you are planning a Van Halen bash with my good friends, Romeo Delight. Fran Galanti, Fran the Man from the Kiss Room House Band. All right, Fran. So I don't think we had anything to do with Alan's situation, to be honest with you. I think that's an algorithm thing that the record companies pick up on because the band is always looking for new ways to make money and to protect their product like the original Studio Masters. So whenever any of that is used and then draws that level of attention and clicks and plays like Alan's stuff was really good. So it drew a lot of attentions you know they tend to go after stuff like that but i'm glad he fixed that and then we could all see the shows that he did which was i think is phenomenal he did a great job so the sammy remasters i think do sound better i'm glad we have them it could be better but i'll take it and 100 episodes i have no idea i'm barely trying to get out these episodes let alone host a, a big shindig but what do you say dave no big anniversary show we just talked about one well, we talked about an Eddie Van Halen tribute, but who knows? You never know. We could host a big 
Eddie Van Halen tribute, then Wolf come after us. You never know. Who knows? You're not allowed. Oh, to too know. bad. You know what? Someone's <laughs> got to rattle the cages over there. Someone's got to show some respect for Ed. And if the band's not going to do it, then two guys doing a podcast are going to do it. So if you all want to show up, you show up. If you don't want to show up, then don't show up. I got the place to hold it. You ready for this? I'm ready. The Van Halen stage in Pasadena. Well, there you go. Right? And we make it a free free show. That's right. You know, this way, we are right at ground zero for Van Halen in Pasadena. Pasadena for Van Halen can host the whole thing, set it up for us. The stage is dedicated to Van Halen. You have all the Van Halen bands go there. Look at that. See? Done. It's already done. Make, what, two, three calls and make it all happen. (laughs) That's all. I will say about the Santa Clara Masters, I mean, they definitely were needed. It's interesting because there's all sorts of opinions about what people hear and what they don't hear. Yeah, yeah. I think it's better. I think it was needed. And I think we were a piece of the Allen Berry equation, but we were definitely not the sole reason. I mean, that guy knew how to get the word out. He was really, like, putting it out there. I mean, I saw him on VH Links. Mm -hmm. I saw him on VH Trading. I saw him on other websites. I mean, he was really doing his best to get the word out there. But, you know, I don't think he got shut down because he did one podcast with us and all of a sudden, you know, that got him all this visibility. He really was getting it out there. He might have been getting it out there a little too loudly and some people in the Van Halen organization took note and that's why he had to make the changes he made. That's true. Letter number 10 comes from Matt Krill and he says, my summary of collection two, can't hear a difference in the remasters, number one. Number two, that's an awful lot of work and probably too much money just to get easier access to crossing over. Number three, as you listen to the full balance album, listening to Do In Time and skipping Blue Ethereum is just dumb for any longtime Van Halen fan. Really choppy to go into Aftershock. It doesn't flow and it doesn't make sense. Keep the faith, Matt Krill. Well, Matt, number one, yeah, the differences are slight for sure. Number two, the studio rarities or slim pickings crossing over is definitely the only true rarity there. And number three, skipping Baluk Ethereum is a crime and it really disrupts the album flow and as Dave pointed out, you know, they even changed the order of the songs, which was ridiculous. That really altered the flavor of the album. What do you think, Dave? I totally agree with you and we've discussed this in the album review that yeah. you not only did they take the song out, they changed the orders of some of the songs. So I really don't know what the heck they were thinking with that. I mean, I hear a difference in the remasters. Seems like a lot just to get crossing over. I think it's more than that, but I hear what you're saying. Letter number 11 comes from Sage Jess. And Sage says, there is an interesting video on the KDH YouTube channel, which is KDH Guitar TV, titled World's Most Expensive Guitar Rigs. One of the five guitarists listed in the costly rig is Ed Van Halen. He made the list. And obviously, we're talking about the different kind of truth era. Keep in mind, this rundown does not include guitars, cables, loop boxes, etc. It's focused primarily on the rigs. And on the Eddie Van Halen rig down, KDH states his opinion. And the KDH stands for Kalen Hughes or something like that. And his opinion says that its 10 speaker cabinets on stage were real and in use. However, the amp heads themselves were sitting atop the speaker cabs were dummy amps and he says the main and backup amps were being controlled backstage and mounted in flight cases just behind the stage speaker cabinets then he gave the estimate of ed's rig cost breakdown he said ed's pedal board comes to about 950 dollars the 10 4 by 12 cabs cost approximately 11,500 5150 and other amps backstage cost 22,050 Grand total of Ed's rig is about $34,500. Ed's rig was the least expensive of the five guitars that he covered. The other guitarist being Angus Young, which came in at $140,355. Ingve Malmsteen, $218,980. John Mayer at $328,343. And Joe Bonamassa at a whopping $488,021. Wow. And Joe is just singing the blues. 
blues. What the fuck? Keep it going. Stay frosty. Cheers. Sage Jess. Well, that's quite a difference there between Ed's the lowest by far. You know, that's unbelievable. It just goes to show you that it was more about his talent than his tech, for sure. But what do you think, Dave? I thought that was really interesting about the artists and how much... I mean, these are all estimates, first yeah, of yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was not surprised that Joe Bonamassa was that expensive because I've read interviews with him. He spends a lot of money on his gear, but he does not spend a lot of money on like his home or anything like oh, okay, that. Okay. He'd rather spend the money on guitars and gear like mm-hmm. that. But I was surprised at the total dollar amount. I mean, that's a lot of money, but still very interesting. I mean, I wanted quality stuff, but then again, he was a tinkerer making his own stuff. Right. So I don't think he thought just he could spend his way to get the best equipment. That wasn't what he was about. Yeah, that's true. Letter number 12 comes from Mark Aremo. And he says here, I found the podcast six months ago and I made it to episode number 59 so far and some of these archive episodes are pure gold but I've decided it's time to join in the present and I'm curious to get your opinion about Crazy From The Heat and its lack of a similarly styled follow up EP or full length album. After 1984 my parents knew who Van Halen was. After 1985 my parents knew who David Lee Roth was. Roth briefly became an icon in 1985 all because of two cover songs with two music videos off of four 14 minute platinum selling four song EP. That seems like a relatively unremarked upon achievement in and of itself. After reestablishing his hard rock bona fides with Eat Him and Smile, did Roth make a career misstep by not reprising his role as the all American jester singing musical standards from disparate genres? This is more of in hindsight is 2020 type of question, but a what if. Thanks, guys. Love the podcast. Mark Aremo. Well, Mark. I don't think so because he did continue it a bit on Eat Him and Smile. If you listen to I'm Easy and That's Life, those were clearly a nod to Crazy From The Heat, those two songs from Eat Him and Smile. I think Crazy From The Heat was more of a one-off novelty kind of thing, and the misstep, in my opinion, was really Skyscraper by not continuing in the more hard rock direction. What do you think, Dave? I agree with you about Skyscraper. You should have kept that more rock. Rocking. I do think your observation about Eam and Smile is on. Dave's EP was basically a one-off, and he had no intention on repeating it. But, surprise, surprise, he had two hit songs off of it. So he doesn't really want to abandon it completely. So he throws a couple of songs on Eat Him and Smile yeah. that are in that vein. Those could have came right off that album. Well, I don't know if I go that far, but maybe the cover of That's Life. But I do think it kind of rocks up. It's more rocking on Eat Him and Smile. It's almost like he wanted to do a, some kind of in-between hybrid of those kind of songs with what he was doing in Van. And Halen, which is what he did. Mm-hmm. So he didn't abandon that type of music completely, but he kind of sort of nodded to it on Even Smile. But the bulk of the songs on Even Smile are hard rock slash heavy metal songs because he knew that's where his bread and butter was and what people wanted to hear. I'd even say, if you look at some of Dave's other albums, song like Two Fools for the Minute. Sounds like it came off crazy from the heat. That's kind of that vibe. Also, Nightlife from the Your Filthy Little Mouth album from 1994 sounds like it came right off of Crazy From The Heat as well. Well, I feel like you're picking any song that has horns in it. No, I mean, I just, it sounds like that kind of vibe. Well, certainly on the Nightlife song from that album, I mean, he was just dipping his foot in every type of genre he could. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, on that album. But your point is well taken that every once in a while he goes back there because he likes that style of music. Yeah, totally. Let it Number 13 comes from Carlo Perrazzo. And he says here, How did Ted Templeman decline the offer to produce a new Aerosmith album with the follow-up to Done With Mirrors due to the fact that he had already committed to produce the Skyscraper album for Dave? According to Ted, after he gave up producing Aerosmith's next record, Dave told him that he was not going to need him anymore 
because he decided to self-produce Skyscraper. A couple weeks ago, I was listening to John Collodner's interview, the long-bearded A&R executive for Geffen Records, on the MUBU TV podcast. He said that he felt responsible for the failure of Done With Mirrors. He thought that David Geffen was going to fire him for this. He was so disappointed with the end result, and he personally fired Ted Templeman from producing Aerosmith's next album. That doesn't add up. What do you think about this? That's number one. Number two, how many songs did Dave demo for the 5150 album? I think that's on the second issue of the Inside Magazine. Alex Van Halen mentioned something about it. The only three songs I know that Dave worked on were the ones that eventually became Good Enough, Summer Nights, and Sucker in a Three Piece. Number three, one song the band loved to play live in the early days on their 1978, 1982, and 1983 tours was Summertime Blues. Given the fact that Diver Down had several cover tunes it would have made sense to include it on that album do you think the song was ever recorded in the studio would love to hear your thoughts on all this all the best carlo pirazzo okay take it one by one number one ted spins it his way in his book on a lot of different subjects to be honest i tend to lean toward john collodner i can't imagine that ted would be allowed to produce the next aerosmith album after done with mirrors flopped which by the way i love done with mirrors but it's more like the old aerosmith than the new Aerosmith. So maybe that was the issue. Like the new direction that Aerosmith headed in with Geffen, this album, Done With Mirrors, definitely sounded more 70s era. And I love that. So I love the song like My Fist, Your Face kind of thing. I love that. And Let The Music Do The Talk, and I love that too. So I like that album. I like the way Ted produced it too. What do you think, Dave? That's a tough one. Yeah. So I wonder if maybe time plays a factor into this for example ted honestly thought he was gonna do the album yeah and then he found out afterwards that he wasn't doing the album but i could see why in his own autobiography he's not gonna put in that he got fired by an a and r guy yeah i think there's a little of that going on mm-hmm. but that interview with collider is, is very interesting it's part of a larger interview he's a fascinating guy yeah to listen to and if you want to know what a and r guys do Mm-hmm. You should listen to that, especially him. He is, pardon the pun, very instrumental in an artist's development and what they do. He'll tell you he was constantly fighting with the guys from Aerosmith on what to do with their career. They oh, didn't want sure. any of it. And he was spouting all sorts of good advice and he just had to do it <laughs> again and again. But you could see why after that Done With Mirrors album didn't do too well, why they would go off in another direction. So what's the truth? As always, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Right. And the second one about Dave demoing songs for 5150, Dave only demoed a handful of songs some of those were the ones that you mentioned another one was eat thy neighbor that was another one it's cloudy it's all hearsay there's no concrete evidence of any of this now dave meaning my partner here just sent me a clip of david lee roth on the howard stern show in 1993 which was right after his pot bust in washington square park where he actually says on the air that he wrote all the melodies to the songs on 5150, which totally is not true. They didn't even get that far on the follow-up to 1984, to be honest, so I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. What did you make of that, Dave? I thought that was interesting. I think Dave is stretching the truth a bit for his own ego. But again, the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? Dave was involved somewhat with the 5150 album. How far along were they only the guys in the band really know that how much did they lay down on tape only they know that it's sitting in 5150 somewhere i'm sure or in dave's archive somewhere because he had cassettes of the stuff that ed had sent him that'd be great stuff to put on a box set maybe one day we'll see that before we pass on we'll see and the third thing where we talk about the summertime blues there is no known or heard of studio recording for summertime blues now the funny thing is is summertime blues is one of those songs that a lot of bands play live it's sort of a fun live song van halen probably knew it from the club days because 
Eddie and Alex used to play live at Leeds backwards and forwards. And live at Leeds, the Who covers Summertime Blues. That's an old Eddie Cochran song. So I don't think they recorded that in the studio. But that could have easily fit on Diver Down. But they never did it. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, that's a great observation. You would think that would be a go-to song for them to cover on an album. But for some reason, they just never did. Letter number 14 comes from MJ in Michigan. And he says, I'm a huge fan of Michael Anthony and believe he was a perfect fit for Van Halen. He's a solid bass player, great vocals, and a fantastic guy. When I learned about Eddie's disdain for Michael, I initially attributed it to drug use. I never heard anything that made me doubt his bass playing abilities until I watched the Castle Donington concert on YouTube and heard his solo. This solo was absolutely terrible and had me thinking there was something there that Eddie was getting at. In general, I think Eddie was the only one who needed to be soloing at concerts, but this shook me. I'm still a fan, but I award Mikey no points for that solo. I feel dumber for having listened to it, and may God have mercy on his soul. MJ and and Mitch. Michigan. Wow, I tell you, that solo, as I talked about when we discussed that, is just laughable and piss poor. However, I think he's better than that. I just think he was merely going for like cheap WWF theatrics, the way he was slamming and jumping all over his back. I mean, it's just no point. It's nothing musical to that. It's more like theatrics. What do you think, Dave? I agree. At that point, his solo was more about the show than it was for music. He knew that, and I think that's just what he was going for. Letter number 15 comes from Eric Torbick, the perfect letter writer from New Jersey. What up, guys? I stumbled across another of Ed's homages recently, and I don't think you've discussed this one. Check out ACDC's Riff Raff from 1978, especially at the 45-second mark. Tell me if you don't hear OU812's AFU Naturally Wired. What do you think? Eric Torbick, the perfect letter writer from New Jersey. Well, he does it again. Another perfect letter from Eric. Here's a clip of ACDC's Riff Raff. Now here's a clip of Van Halen's AFU Naturally Wired. <laughs> You can definitely tell that there's some lineage there. ACDC's song Riff Raff comes from Ed's favorite ACDC album, Powerage. And I'm sure that's the nod. He loves that album. So do I. It's, I think, the best ACDC album, in my opinion. And I think that Ed was probably, as we all know from Trevor Rabin, that he likes to lift things (laughs) that he likes. So who knows? What do you think, Dave? I think it was definitely an influence. That riff is not exactly all that uncommon. Yeah. And I think Ed was probably subconsciously tapping into that, but I don't think it was a direct lift. Okay. Letter number 16, the last letter of the night. Dave's absolute favorite comes from Mike DiGiorgio from Rochester. He says, hey guys, I thought you might want to hear this. A friend of mine who was a Warren Zevon fan sent me a link to a bootleg of his show that Warren did in Rochester, New York, where he does a one minute acoustic version of Why Can't This Be Love? Here's a link. Mike DiGiorgio from Rochester. And here's a clip of the late Warren Zevon playing Why Can't This Be Love acoustically. Here it comes. Funny feet again. Winding me up inside every time we touch. it takes so tell me why can't this be love so from the heart tell me why can't this be love why indeed 
Now, I love Warren Zevon. I think this was very different to hear it acoustically. It's okay. It's just a clip of it. He didn't even do the whole song. Actually, I think it would have worked better as a dramatic ballad coming from Warren because he does those beautiful dramatic ballads. I love the song he does, Keep Me In Your Heart. That's a beautiful song. And if anybody's ever seen his last performance on Letterman, it's really intense. Letterman did like a whole special segment with him before he passed away. And he plays the song Mutineer. And it's just incredible. It breaks your heart because he passed away not too long after that. I'll never forget that. Watching that live, that was really wild. And he has some of the greatest lyrics. Warren Zevon, really good lyricist. But it was cool to give a nod to Van Halen. He says on the bootleg, he's like, oh, I figured I'd start with a little Van Halen to warm you guys up for the evening. He just does like a minute of the song. But it's funny that he chose that particular one. What did you think of it, Dave? Yeah, that was surprising that he would pick a Van Halen song just to, you know, randomly do for a minute or so. For the minute he did it, it was pretty interesting because he played it pretty straight Mm -hmm. i was like wow that could really work acoustically so he did an impressive job and you're right he was an artist like people knew his name but didn't know a lot about his work but he definitely had a a gift for sharp lyrics oh yeah things like that he left us too soon sadly absolutely and that wraps up the mailbag segment And we are on to our interview with incredible writer and producer Desmond Child. Desmond Child is a guy that has written with some of the biggest names in rock, including Kiss, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith. And we talk about his run-in with David Lee Roth and Van Halen. He's got an interesting story that goes with that. We also get into some of the history and background of some of the other artists that he worked with that I just mentioned, like Kiss and Aerosmith and Bon Jovi and all those different good artists. We talk about his new book and it's really, really cool. He's a nice guy, very intelligent guy, unbelievably successful individual. Rarely do you see that many hits coming out of one man, but he really helped write some of the biggest songs of the 80s and 90s and he's just an interesting, interesting dude. He was going to write with Van Halen and there's a whole story about that and what happened with that. And he was also going to write with David Lee Roth as a solo artist and the story that goes with that. So he gets into all those details, and that's all coming up next. Take a listen. I think we're just a, a from-the-heart rock and roll band, you know? Most musical band I've ever been in. Check out the new podcast, The Rock Quarry, your place to hear in-depth interviews with some of rock's most colorful characters with your host, entertainment journalist David J. Crible. The Rock Quarry is available for free on Spreaker and iTunes. You can check us out on Facebook at The Rock Quarry Podcast, on Twitter at Rock Quarry Pod, on Instagram at The Rock Quarry Podcast, or email us at Podcast at gmail.com. And if you would like to send us a letter asking a question or making a statement or whatever you'd like to say, you can send it to ddunchainedpodcast at gmail.com. Hello, loyal listeners. Wanted to let you know about our new Patreon. If you like what we do and you have the means, drop us a donation to keep the podcast going. Go to patreon.com backslash ddunchained. That's P A T. R-E-O-N dot com backslash D-D-U-N-C-H-A-I-N-E-D. Any size contributions are greatly appreciated. We have special packages to those who donate $45 or more. You'll get the Unchained package. Trust me, it's worth it. Contribute $65 or more and you can get the Romeo Delight package, which is Unchained plus more. $95 $95 or more scores you the Top Jimmy package, which is the kitchen sink. If you're a Van Halen hardcore and listen to this cast, this is stuff you'll appreciate. It's ear candy. Those who want one of the packages, simply email ddunchainedpodcast at gmail.com. That's d-d-u-n-c-h-a-i-n-e-d-p-o-d-c-a-s-t at gmail.com to make arrangements. What is understood need not be discussed. Hey, folks, this is Steve I. You're listening to Dave and Dave Unchained, so turn it up. 
Martin Popoff here. Hope you're enjoying this latest episode of Dave and Dave Unchained, the wise swamis on all things VH. Just wanted to remind you that at martinpopoff.com, I've got two Van Halen books that I wrote. Uh, one is Van Halen, a visual biography, which is basically a big hardcover coffee table book, 400 images, 20,000 word detailed timeline. And the other one is called Unchained, a Van Halen user manual. It's the uh, sort of 120,000 word, very academic, a lot of crazy chapters, a lot of trivia, a wordy book uh, that I did on Van Halen. So yes, uh, go to martinpopoff.com. I sign and ship those out of my office here in Toronto. There's PayPal buttons for the US, international and Canada. Again, Van Halen, a visual biography and Unchained, a Van Halen user manual. Back to Dave and Dave. Hey folks, I'd like to introduce you to the Classic Rock Album by Album Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Rock Album by Album Podcast where no stone is left unturned in the show's epic quest to review and dissect every single rock album ever made. You can find the Classic Rock Album by Album podcast wherever podcasts can be found, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Our website address is classicrockalbumbyalbum.libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. And we can be reached on Facebook at fb.me slash Classic Rock Album by Album. See you soon from the Classic Rock Album by Album podcast. Need a laugh? Check out the Funny How Comedy podcast, which focuses on upbeat conversations with legendary comedians. It's free on Spreaker and iTunes. Check us out on Facebook at Funny How Comedy Podcast, on Twitter at Funny How Podcast, on Instagram at Funny How Comedy Podcast, or email us at Funny How Comedy Podcast at gmail.com. Dan Halen, to a small degree, and myself to a large degree, are primarily motivated by fear and revenge. When we discuss how we felt when Van Halen 1984 went number one, when Jump went number one and this kind of thing, it was a feeling of satisfaction. Van Halen has always come down to the beach with a sword in one hand and a torch in the other. And we always knew that we were going to get up there someday. And we, and we took the worst possible avenue of getting there. We said, we won't try and accomplish it at all. We'll just lay back. <laughs> if God wants it to happen, then it will. We'll make records, we'll tour, we'll dress ourselves up, we'll play for our own satisfaction. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an unbelievable guest this evening. He is a legendary songwriter. You all know him. He is Desmond Child. Welcome, Desmond. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, it's so great to see you guys. Well, not see you guys, to hear you guys. Awesome. <laughs> Close enough. Exactly. Close enough, right. Desmond has an incredible new book all about his life called Living on a Prayer, Big Songs, Big Life. And Desmond, at the top, I want to tell you that I'm 53 years old, so is Dave, and we grew up listening to all of your music. Whenever I saw your name in the songwriting credits that I would read religiously in the liner notes, we always knew it was going to be a quality song. So thank you for all those incredible songs. <laughs> thank you for saying so. Oh, of course. Amazing. So just to start off the interview, I always wanted to ask you, when you are brought in to write with a legendary band who's established, what is the vibe like? Are they open and welcoming, or do they get resentful and bitter that they need help? I think it's probably the latter. You know, some are nicer than others, but, you know, it is kind of like one of those humbling things, especially if they've had like a string of unsuccessful records. You know, but the thing is, what's so different about me and a producer or the guy that's operating the tape or the guy that cleans the studio? It's like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You're all there to help. That's the whole point. It's like, look at all the credits on Avatar. But yeah. the critics made it so that artists after Bob Dylan and people like that, 
and even the bands and the Beatles, of course, they had to self-write. You know, they have to write their own song. Right. Or else it wasn't believable. You know, you had to believe that if they were singing a song like Yesterday, that was Paul McCartney's personal life story. So what happened was that not everybody has that kind of skill. So then the quality of albums just kept going down and down and down and down because, yeah. you know, everybody wants to be a star. And then also people are plucked out of high school to be stars. It's like they didn't get a chance to earn it. Right. They didn't get a chance to get good at it and live it sure. and have stories to write about. That's why people need help because without a story, you have no song. That's very true. Is there a different vibe with newer bands who aren't as well established? Like, for example, when you started with Bon Jovi, they weren't the superstars that they became after you started writing for them. So was there any resentment for them or were they more of the opinion of, hey, we'll do anything in order to get to the top? Well, I didn't find out till many Bon Jovi interviews later that they wrote with me not for Bon Jovi. They thought I could get them cuts on other people's records to help bring in extra money. Oh, that's weird. Oh, you know, because, yeah. you know, I was like, in their minds, a pop writer. Right. So that wasn't considered cool or rock or, right. you know, uh -huh. whatever. And the fact is, yes, we did get other people to cut the songs we wrote. But the first song we wrote together was You Give Love a Bad Name. And they weren't about to let that one go. <laughs> and then the second song we wrote was called Living on a Prayer. And, you know, it goes on and on like that. It wasn't until the next album, New Jersey, we wrote a song called We All Sleep Alone. And John said, ah, I can't sing that. That's like a chick song. And it's like, wow, because I was just starting to produce Cher. And I said, be perfect for Cher. Sure. And so John and Richie co-produced that with me. Mm -hmm. And that's when Richie met Cher. Uh -huh. And then the rest is tabloid history. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. So now that song that you just mentioned, You Give Love a Bad Name, obviously a classic. Now, there's the Bonnie Tyler song that you were involved with, If You Were a Woman and I Was a Man. They have similar parts. What was the story behind that? In 1983... I got a call from Jim Steinman, who had an artist named Bonnie Tyler, and they just had the biggest hit in the entire world called Total Eclipse of the Heart. Exactly. And he was looking for songs of mine. He had heard a song of mine called Lovers Again, and that's what got him to call me. And he cut Lovers Again with Bonnie. Okay. And then he said, can you write me a song? Because I don't have time to write everything. Can you write me a song where the verses sound like Tina Turner, the B section sounds like the police, and the chorus sounds like Bruce Springsteen? <laughs> I said, okay. Tall order. But there was one caveat, uh -huh. which was it had to be about androgyny. Oh, okay. So I came up with the title, If You Were a Woman and I Was a Man. Wow. That's cool. Which, and, okay. Well, you you know, we're pretty boxes. much ahead of our time, right? Yeah, no, totally. Absolutely. Right, In right. terms of like, you know, yeah. what are you? Right. right? <laughs> the verses start out, how's it feel to be a woman? How's it feel to be a man? Are we really that different? Tell me where we stand. And that was the Tina Turner part. Then the B section goes, I look at you, you look away. Why did you say we're night and day? You know? Oh. Right. And so that's like Roxanne. Da -da -da -da. Yeah. yeah. Like that, those kind of jumps, right? Gotcha. And then the chorus, you know, I just went for the jug with Because the Night. Right. It had like a similar kind of feeling. Springsteen was so big, especially in the East Coast, he was like the god. And we all just lived in his world. Uh huh. And his song goes, Because the Night belongs to lovers and mine went if you were a woman it goes up instead of not down uh -huh. if you were a woman and i was a man would it be so hard to understand and it had that kind of springsteen like bravado anthemic quality sure and so bonnie caught caught up in this switch over of the hierarchy of sony records at the time and a lot of bands did and acts and especially if you were from the uk so many people were lost, you know, like the Eurythmics, Culture Club, like so many, even George Michael. I mean, like so many got lost in the shuffle and never had a hit again. Yeah, that's true. You know? Yeah, it's very, very and true. And so Bonnie got caught in that tidal wave. That was like actually a little bit before, you okay. know? Okay. And they didn't put anything into her. Okay. And so the song was popular in Europe a little bit. It was kind of a hit in France. 
Right. And I was so disappointed because I thought that was going to be her next Total Eclipse of the Heart. She sounded awesome on it. Everything like came together. I solely wrote that song. So when I went to write with Bon Jovi a couple of years later, I had what I knew was a hit chorus and also kind of like a format because like in If You Were a Woman, I Was a Man, it was like, dun, 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 dun. it was sort right. of like the Billie Jean thing. Right. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, it was like something based on like that. So I told Richie, I said, well, try this, you know, like a guitar, like, and he's, oh man, that's like Billie Jean. That's like Michael Jackson and stuff. And I right. said, well, I was thinking more like Eurythmics, but whatever. Right. But play it with like, you know, hard, like, you right. know, but chug, like really right. choke, like, chum, 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 chum. Right. so it sounds like Jaws or something. Right, exactly. And as soon as he started doing that, John's eyes like lit up, you know, like, wow. okay, we got something here. And so John threw in, shot through the heart, because he had a song previously right. on the previous album that he had written called exactly. Shot Through the Heart. Exactly. And then, you know, I had the title in my back pocket too, uh -huh. you know, You Give Love a Bad Name. Uh -huh. And when I said that title, all of a sudden, it wasn't just literally up eyes it was like the more teeth than i'd ever seen on a human being <laughs> <laughs> it was like he glowed right away the three of us three-way fist bump you give love a bad name and it's like boom an hour and a half later the song was written wow that's incredible now is it true that john was considering leaving living on a prayer off the album yes that song, even though it's a classic now, even back then, anybody could hear that song and be like, that's a number one song. How could he not hear that? Because he had this other brand image in his mind. It was supposed to be hard rock uh -huh. and also like stadium rock, fists in the air stuff like ACDC meet right. Halen or something. That was his vision in his mind because he thought he could perform better like that. And so when we wrote the song, really, it was kind of like a spooky ballad in a way, but it wasn't meant to stay that way it was just that's how we wrote it and it was sentimental right and it wasn't about sex drugs or rock and roll it was a story about a struggling couple you know because in my mind he represented the working class man sure you know, the, blue collar in new know, jersey yeah mm -hmm. blue collar yeah. yeah yeah from new jersey yep, yep and so when we went to write the song he later much later said that he had a couple in his mind bonnie and joe that he and dorothea knew from high school that had married young and really struggling but he never really said that i think that's what he had in his mind but before that period of time i had a group called desmond child and root and my girlfriend was one of the girls in the group uh -huh. maria vidal okay and when she was working as a waiter waitress in a diner. Her waitress name was Gina. Oh, okay. And so I would be home just trying to pluck out songs and she was working for a man to bring home or pay for love. Right. And so to me, you know, like that's where Gina came from. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, at first I suggested Johnny and Gina because of alliteration. <laughs> right. But then John said, that would be dumb because my name is Johnny. Right, and right. So people <laughs> would think I'm singing about myself. It's right. Like, oh. Right. Yeah, yeah. Everybody kind of like looked around and it's like, Tommy, you know, <laughs> it was like Tommy and Gina. Right. And that's how Tommy and Gina were born. But the fact is that he thought the song was a little sentimental for the tone yeah. that he wanted Bon Jovi to be. Remember, that was the moment when it was called heavy metal. I know, and, I know. You know, is... all those mullets and all those rip-torn <laughs> jeans and all of those bracelets and lipstick. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. You know, had to have a contrast. Exactly. <laughs> of something hard to go with. It. It's true. One of my favorite Bon Jovi songs is Edge of a Broken Heart, and it always blew my mind that they left that off of Slippery When Wet. Why would you leave a song like that off that album? I don't know. Did they ever cut that song? No, they cut it, and it was released on the soundtrack to the Disorderlies, which was a Fat Boys movie, and I love the song so much, and it became a Bon Jovi classic that a lot of the fans used to go crazy for and it was highly requested on the radio. It came out as like a B-side and then it ended up on the box set and it's available and it's around, but it's kind of known as this lost hit that the band really could have had. And I never understood that they would leave something like Social Disease on the album and not put like Edge of a Broken Heart. Well, maybe also, I got four songs on Slippery. Maybe they felt like... I had 
a fifth one, then it's like maybe that would have been kind of diminishing their dynamic duo songwriting thing. I don't know what was going on yeah. in their mind. But maybe it was too similar to something else. You know, you never know what goes on in somebody's mind at that moment. Or maybe because they used to play all the songs for teens, they'd bring them in after school into a little mini theater, like where they had many movies going on. Right. And then they would like stand in front and then they had speakers and then they would play the songs and see what the reactions were. I mean, they would play like 25 songs. They used to call it the pizza parlor jury, right? They would get the kids yeah. from the pizza parlor and bring them down to listen to the songs to get their reactions. Yeah, I went to one of those. It was very much fun. Oh, wow, I can imagine. But, you know, he was smart because he was like doing his own testing. Yeah, yeah, it was like, it was and like, he was, yeah. like exactly. really listening to what the fans, so maybe the way the demo came out or this or that, maybe it just didn't resonate Interesting. in one of those sessions. Interesting. Never was he know. testing one of your songs the time you went? Yeah, absolutely. I think it was the songs from New Jersey. Okay. All know, right, cool. Like Bad Medicine. Now, so. when you're writing with these guys, but you're not a member of the band, but you're still an esteemed, accomplished writer, where do you stand on who calls the shots? Like, is it difficult to say, John, that sucks, or that doesn't work? Or, like, where do you find your footing? Well, I've always been really blunt. Ultimately, the band calls the shots. And ultimately, of course, in Bon Jovi, you right. know, John Bon Jovi, right. as in Bon Jovi. <laughs> <laughs> it's really his band. He's Absolutely. the writer of the band. So, and he's not without his opinions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's why the band succeeded. But if I thought he was not going in the right direction, I would speak up. And Richie, too. It's like animatedly, where Richie and I got literally on the floor, hands and knees half joking, half serious, begging him to please cut living on a prayer. Well, that was the smartest thing you ever did because that song is... It was the smartest thing he ever listened to. Exactly. Was he really so resistant to taking a more pop approach? Because he really brought that melodicism to heavy metal that, yeah. you know, wasn't as well, popular. Well, it changed the course eating. of popular music. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, right. nothing was the same and every band tried to copy them from yeah. Poison oh. to Motley crew to yeah. you know everybody tried to evoke that bright a little bit nasally sound yeah and all of that and then you know of course when rock flip then it was the opposite we had nothing but baritones right oh you right. know kind of like seven dark yeah. and you know that kind of stuff the shoegazers right, see, exactly you know the people from the 80s they were chest up the people from the 90s were chest sunk in looking down everything about it was okay you do this way we do it opposite gotcha you know? yeah you know nirvana hit the nerve and yeah. all the bands i worked with never got on vh1 or mtv or anything in heavy rotation again yeah it was like a death knell to yeah. hard rock how did that affect your career when that happened well you know my own manager who was also managing michael he did black hole sun and stuff the sound garden yeah sound garden he produced that michael my manager Beanhorn? managed him as Beanhorn? michael beinhorn beinhorn yeah beinhorn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah my manager managed him as well and you know basically he was seeing that guy's success and all the seattle business and he said you know honestly you should just give up on producing just you know songwrite and your time is gone basically wow. he was saying so it was that right at that time that you know i had decided to do my own record discipline uh -huh. and it was really not forward at all it was more exactly the same stuff but it was more pop in a way so in a way i was sort of like michael bolton or richard marx or something like that but you know it's more rocky than that i didn't really know what i was doing but i just felt like i had suppressed my own wanting to be a star and I said okay this is my moment maybe I can slip in through the cracks between the two eras but it didn't really work you know that's the thing it's like what I did was after my record failed I started hearing what sounded like Bon Jovi in bars and things and it was like but sounds like Bon Jovi but it has twang right what the heck is that and that was Garth Brooks and so I said oh my god I have to go to Nashville they making my kind of music there wow you know I just have to learn you know the twang and so the very first song I wrote was with Victoria Shaw who was a co-writer of Garth Brooks so that was my strategy I'd get into her and I did and he was just 
starting his relationship with Trisha Yearwood, and she recorded a song called Where Your Road Leads, and he was the duet partner on that, and maybe made them fall in love more, nah. destroyed two marriages, and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> They're still together, so that's, it ended well. That's good. So I got what I wanted, like in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. but then my husband and I, like we started falling in love with all the few friends we had met, like right. Marcus Humman and his wife, the Reverend Becca Stevens, all these people, some of them came from EMI. I was signed to EMI, so I'd go there to write in the writing rooms, and then I started making friends with all of these other writers. And we started feeling really like close to those people and said, geez, why don't we just get a place here? And then when we come into town, you know, I can write there. And, you know, we built a kind of a, a rustic cabin on a little mountaintop overlooking the city. Nice. Then at the same time, the Northridge earthquake happened. Okay. And we got scared of being in Los Angeles. So so we ran to Miami Beach, where I'm from, and bought a mansion on the water there, you know, that was half the price of our house in California. So that's where I started my career again in Latin music. Wow. So I just shifted style. Yeah. But in a way, when I went to work with Ricky Martin, mm -hmm. I used everything I learned from Kiss, Paul Stanley. Oh, totally. And Aerosmith and Bon Jovi stadium anthems and applied it to Latin music. Totally, yeah. So, That's you know, album. you listen to The Cup of Life. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Ale, ale, ale. That kind of stuff. Totally. And then, you know, upside, inside, out. Living la vida loca. Right, right. It's fist in the air stuff. It was too. super effective. And I also developed one of the first professional Pro Tools studios in my garage. Actually, Living la vida loca became history made Making the first song completely recorded in the box and mixed in the box, no analog wow. whatsoever, to go all the way to number one. That's and incredible. last year we were inducted into the Library of Congress National Registry of Recorded Music. That's beautiful. Every year they pick 25 recordings. It's not, you know, it could be baseball games. It could be all these recordings. We were inducted, the three of us, Ricky Martin, Draco Rosa, and myself. Congrats. Because yeah. we made the record. So you see, like, I've reinvented myself several times times. Totally. Before I worked with KISS, I was in my group Desmond Child and Rouge, and we yeah. were actually ahead of our time. We were doing dance beats with rock guitars, yep. and doing singer-songwriter storytelling, yeah. and yeah. all this kind of stuff. But we were a little before our time. But we went pretty far in one year, because we made it all the way to be the musical guests of Saturday Night Live. Exactly. That's like winning like the Nobel Prize of exactly. show business. So, so what I'm hearing is happened. you'd rather brave a hurricane than an earthquake. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I so never got good. one while I was there. Oh, that's good. Oh, okay. That's... Then you're good luck. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm good luck for Florida. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> so now, Desmond, I want to ask you one thing that was interesting in your book, page 198, is you talk about your bizarre meeting with David Lee Roth. How did that whole meeting happen who set that up and why was it set up I'm, I think it was their manager or something or their A&R person because remember David Lee Roth had already left Van Halen yes yes so he was trying to develop his you know kind of master of ceremonies thing right and, you know, he was looking for people to collaborate with. And because I'd had success with Bon Jovi and Aerosmith and Kiss and yeah. Joan Jett and, yeah. you know, all these things, it seemed like I was a natural. So he comes in. I had met my husband and, and we moved to California and we had this little apartment. So I rented like a little side office about a block away. What year was it this? Was really just this was 89, 90. Maybe it was 90 by then. No, it was like 89. OK, it was like almost like a little closet, little narrow thing with a little desk and I had a phone and, okay. you know, it was kind of thing and I had a little keyboard and whatnot. And he comes in, you know, kind of with a lot of attitude in character, I would say. And he said, you know, I want to play you what I'm all about, what my music is really all about. I said, okay. So he gives me this cassette. I put it in and it's like stripper music, like boom, bam, ba, boom, bam, ba, wah, wah, wah. You know, it's wow. like, like stripper music from Jeez. the 40s or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, there's, you know, these two girls walk in wearing fedoras, raincoats, and high stilettos. And then they fling the coats off and they're completely naked underneath. Like, did you say anything? Completely, I mean, like. But did you say anything at this point? Like, what the fuck are you doing? Or? No, my mouth was wide open. And they, like, start doing, like, split beavers. 
And oh it's my like, god! I, you know, I don't think he understood that I'm gay, but whatever. Well, I mean, that's really <laughs> and this offensive. Is the first time you've met him, right? Like within minutes of meeting okay. him, okay. and so they start doing all this this stuff, and you know, this like choreographed stuff and spinning around and jumping on each other. And he's like with a big smile on his face. And all of a sudden he turns off the music and they like get up really quick and throw their coats around themselves. And they go, well, if you need any more inspiration, give us a call. And then they marched out. And what did you say to him? I was just laughing at this point. I thought it was like really funny. And, and he really went all out to do the skit. You know, we said, OK, well, you know, let's get together and like, let's try to write again. But he never called me back. But but like there was no conversation after that that entire routine like dave what the fuck little, did you like just... a little bit of chit chat like well yeah we should get together and like you know see what we come up with you, i expected a return call and for you know his people and talk to my people and then we would go rent a studio and figure something out you know what i'm saying that's how it usually would go right but usually people don't bring strippers to meetings didn't you turn to him and be like dave what, what the fuck this is in your home no this is in that little office that i rented right but it, that's still it's still your place though right i mean yeah, like it was my play that's what i mean like you bring these disgusting strippers who are lying on the floor and and spreading their leg like in my freaking house like what are you doing dude <laughs> <laughs> why does... do you think he never got back to you maybe i didn't give him the hetero vibe he was looking for i don't know but you're very straightforward um, in who you are I, but the story has a second part which is not long after that i get a call from my manager saying hey van halen what's right with you and it's like okay which one is okay eddie and whatever i go up to eddie's house where he has a studio and you know i get there and you know they're kind of coming in one at a time and all this i didn't know how the session was going to evolve what year was this same year it was like 89 90 or something like that now wh- isn't I'm- sammy in the band at this point no they didn't have a lead singer they didn't have a lead singer in 96 that's when sammy left sammy wasn't in it yet i don't think i'm confused about time but maybe okay. it was 96 i don't know i think it must have been 96 when they were doing no, the no, greatest no, hits no, no no it wasn't because i moved to our new house in 89 in santa monica okay so this was like right then sammy was in the band from 1986 to 1996 well, maybe this was like, okay. Then, wasn't it for the greatest? I didn't meet Sammy. He was not around. Okay? What about what about Gary Sharon? Was he around? No, no. And, I think uh, Michael Anthony was, right? Michael Anthony, of course. Yeah, he was in the band. So okay. now, do you think this was for the best of, where they wanted a couple extra songs, new songs for the best of? They didn't say what it was, and oh. I thought maybe they were going to like write the song and get Sammy to sing it, or Sammy okay. would join the song. Right. I didn't know what it was. But while I was up there, who rolls in top-down convertible but David Lee Roth? And this is after the stripper incident? Oh, yeah. Okay. But, like, not long after. Okay. So all of a sudden, he bombs in, you know, like, to break up the session. But, like, what does he say when he gets out of the car? I think that he, in a way, was trying to see if they would take him back. Okay, but what does he say? He pulls up what happens. It's like somebody tipped him off that I was up there. So he didn't want the session to happen without him, or maybe not at all. And so I had heard that he was, like, looking for, you know, maybe a way back in. You know, with all of these people, like, nothing is forever. No, of course, of course. And nothing is for sure. So even though Sammy stayed and he stayed and he stayed, there could have been a moment where they made up and kicked him out, and he comes roaring back, and the tour is bigger than ever. Are the band surprised to see Dave there? It was very uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable, and it killed our session, you know? But, like, when Dave gets out of the car, what does he say? What the fuck are you guys doing? Like, what does he say? I don't know, but it's like, hey, you know, what do you guys... Yeah, it was like, what are you guys doing? You know, and all this kind of stuff. And this was all outside. Right. You know, so I don't know if he even got out of the car. But before I knew it, I was in my car out of there. They just canceled the session, and I left. So they told you to go home? Yeah. You never noodled around with Eddie or played guitar? Or like No, enough? never. It was one of those things. I was a, like a little pawn in a, like a strange little court Did, duet. How long were you there before Roth arrived? I was there like maybe an hour. Like, so, you know, and people kind of coming in and getting a cup of tea and like when, no music when you, was happening. It was just like people kind of milling around, you know, and I figured, okay, well, maybe this is like the way it starts. 
Were you in 5150, like the actual studio? We were in his house, which was up on Mulholland or something, with the studio that was in the house. The studio is on the property. Yeah, on the property, right. yeah. You were in the home, not the studio? No, I was coming in and out of the studio. Oh, in and out of the studio. Out of All side right. doors. When, before you go to the meeting, do they give you a briefing like, listen, Eddie wants to write with you, Desmond. We want a hit song. Or like, no, did- I don't think they wanted to write with me. It was the same thing like, you know, when Claudner imposed me on Aerosmith. It was like they weren't that comfortable with it but couldn't deny my success and maybe, okay, we should try it, you okay. know, kind of thing. All right. All so right. it wasn't like the warmest of welcoming and or excitement or any kind of real appreciation of me. But it was one of those things that were put together by the suits. Let me ask you a question. For years, people have wondered about Dave's sexuality. What vibe do you get from him? Oh, well, you know, I've got nothing gay about it. No? I think he just played around with like that kind of swagger i mean paul stanley did the same thing yeah yeah right for the stage you know like like swooshing around right like walking like a model like one foot in front of the other right 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 you know all this kind of like swerving around and i think some of that influenced bon jovi too oh really because you know i mean look the look was very similar right and you know the hairy chest and the whole thing yeah yeah it was like that and then kind of like a freedom to run around and you know kind of be playful right you know and kind of like be flirty every which way that kind of was part of the era right that's true he's sort of playing a role i guess right yeah Yeah. yeah, i mean totally it's a role yeah it's like you know i'm the master of ceremonies like cabaret or something like right yeah almost like cabaret rocky horror picture show gotcha gotcha yeah you know and then it doesn't mean anything in bed it's just for show that's interesting and then what did you make of Dave's solo career, it seems like someone like yourself could have really helped him, right? I think so, because I think I would have given him good scripts to sing about, like clever lyrics with a lot of double entendres and, you know, like Mm -hmm. hooks that people could remember, not just have him thrashing around. Right. Like what I did, you know, when I went to work with Aerosmith. Exactly. In fact, I brought up Van Halen when I went to meet Aerosmith because I walked into this big warehouse where they had the whole setup on the ground were like a hundred guitars, like all in rows. I never saw so many like sparkly Fenders, you know, Gibson, specially made guitars that look like spaceships. I mean, like every kind of guitar imaginable was at Joe's disposal on the floor. And then there was a stage built up. On the side of the stage, there was like a soundboard. I guess it was the monitor guy. And they were working on a, when I walked in, you know, this big door opens and I'm walking through this beam of light, like towards them. And Steven's walking towards me, like he's all lit, like almost like a spotlight. He was just all smiles and a big mouth and all that stuff, which is, you know, that's the way he looks. Yep. And so he kind of grabbed me and said, hey, come over here. I want to play you something. And so Joe was working on this backward guitar loop. Okay. And went, anana, 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 right? Right. And then Steven started going, cruising for the ladies. Anana, anana, cruising for the ladies. And then they stopped and they said, what do you think of that? I said, that's really bad. <laughs> And Joe's like crossed his arms and his head like went back and he's looking at me like with slit eyes from the side, you know. (laughs) And I said, as a joke, I said, I don't think Van Halen would put that on the B side of their worst record. Oh, Oh, shit. (laughs) And Joe was like really all curled up, you know. I think Stephen liked hearing that kind of hard talk, you know. Yeah. And Stephen said, well, you know, sheepishly, I originally was singing Dude Looks Like a Lady. And I said, what? Dude Looks Like a Lady. Dude Looks Like a Lady. And I said, that's a hit title. Wow. And then Joe said, well, but, you know, we don't know what that means. I said, I'm gay. I know what it means. Okay. (laughs) And he said, but we don't want to insult the gay community. I said, you wouldn't be. Right. Just follow me with this. So I said, tell me the story of how you came up with Dude Looks Like a Lady. So Stephen tells the story about them going into this bar on the shore with his roadie guys, friends, whatever. They went for some non-alcoholic beverage. And at the end of the this long bar, all by herself was this creature with this big platinum mullet with this curvy figure and this 
porcelain skin and, you know, like black nails and like bracelets and things. And they were all like kind of pulling straws, like who was going to go up and say something or say hello or whatever, yeah. try to pick her up. So all of a sudden she turns around and it's Vince Neal of Motley Crue. <laughs> And that's when Steven said, ooh, that dude looks like a lady. He uh, looks like a lady. That's stuck in his mind. That's awesome. But they didn't make the leap that that could actually be the title of a song with the story of cruised into a bar on the shore. Her picture graced the grime on the door. Then they stopped playing that in concert. Do you think they were afraid of offending the trans community or? No. Huh. I don't I mean, know why they stopped it, playing it. I don't know. Maybe he got sick of playing it. Maybe. Could be. You know, I don't know when he dropped the song because... Because any time I saw them, they played it and it was killed. Yeah, I just recently and, saw and them. Everybody yeah. knew the song and it's a standard. Oh, it's a, it's incredible. And it's licensed constantly, so it's like a standard, really. Mrs. Really, Doubtfire, Mrs. Doubtfire, I remember from Mrs. In Doubtfire, that, yeah. like one of the yeah. examples of it. How I, did you function between Stephen and Joe? Because those guys are razor sharp. So in terms of like their constant friction, how would you describe the dynamic and, and working between them? Well, they're like brothers that fight, you know, or okay. like argue and. And sometimes they would do the best effort to be warm to each other and all that. But it was a long history. And they had broken up and right. they got back together because they knew what was good for them when they sobered up. And they made it a real business, you know. Sure. So, you know, the good thing about somebody like me is I could arbiter. You know, I could say, well, I think Joe's right about that. Steven's right about that. Then there was someone to break the tie. Now, because these guys are so full of machismo and they're so, you know, ridiculous about their heterosexuality, were they respectful to you because you were from the gay community? Were they cool or because they were artists, they were respectful? No, they were always very respectful. Okay, good, good. Oh, good cause, cause, but, you know, it's like if you really study Dude Looks Like a Lady, the second verse says, never judge a book by its cover. Right, exactly. Or you're going to love by your lover. Right. I mean, we were 40 years ahead of time. Oh, totally. You know? Absolutely, yeah. And also later he goes, my funky lady, I like it, like it, like it, like that. Right, yeah. And so the guy is shocked to find out that what he's attracted to right. is not what he thought. Right. But he doesn't leave and he goes for it. It's, it's like, cool. hey, you know, looks good. I'm in. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so that was very progressive kind of thing. Totally. Do you realize that the band had that much gas left in the tank and that they would reach heights that they never even reached at their highest? I didn't really know. I I was just following orders. Right. Like, you know, John Claudner, the A&R guy, he was very brilliant. At that time, I was working with him on Cher's project, and then he, he brought me into the Aerosmith. And I think that that was a really great chemistry in respect that we finally got with each other. And I wrote a lot of songs with them, including What It Takes, Hearts Done Time, oh, yeah. Angel, Crazy, Flesh. Ain't That a Bitch. Yep. A lot of songs, you know, for oh, the yeah. years. Love them all. One song that I love that you wrote is become such a polarizing song, which is Kisses I Was Made for Loving You. That is a big hit, and it drew a huge line in the sand with Kiss fans. Paul loves it. Gene hates it. Regardless, it's always in the set every night and remains a huge sing-along in the show. So what is it about that song that was so divisive? And also, what makes it so addictive? Well, first of all, we broke new ground with that song, yeah. Paul and I. Because remember, in 1978, when we wrote it, was the end of what they called disco. In fact, some jerk in Chicago was getting everybody to bring all the disco records to the stadium and to burn them, like the Nazis burning books. Oh, right. That was, that was like the beginning of the end, right? Right. And so... It was very anti-black and it was very anti-gay. Yes. Because all of that disco music became like the anthems for the gay pride. Right. After the Stonewall riots and all of that. And so all of this kind of heartland white dudes yeah. weren't having it. Right. And right. they decided, well, we're going to, you know, rock is the only thing we want to listen to. So that's the thing that ushered in the 80s. And so I adapted, of course, and moved out of the kind of blue-eyed soul music I was doing. But right there in the crack of it, Paul Stanley in 1978 came to see my group, Desmond Child and Rouge. He had seen our posters all around New York City, and he was intrigued by our look and these three beautiful women I sang with and all this. And he poked his head in around the curtain where our dressing room was right off the stage. I mean, there was no dressing room. It was just like we were behind the curtain getting ready. And he said, hey, I'm Paul Stanley of Kiss. 
we never knew what he looked like because no one ever knew what his face looked like. They always went around with masks and things. And it's like, yeah. He said, well, I just want to let you know that sitting at the front table is George Harrison of the Beatles. And I almost like died. You know, I right. felt like this wow. narcolepsy attack. I was like, oh, I just want to go to sleep. I'm like, I'm so tired. I just can't even keep my eyes open. <laughs> you know, it was like that. And we went out there and killed. And then afterwards he came backstage and he said, hey, you guys are great. You know, you and I should try writing a song together. And so I said, okay. So we made a, a deal. Like he would write a song with me for my group. And then I'd write a song with him for his group. And so the first song we wrote was called The Fight, which was based on a riff that I had started with David Landau, John Landau's brother, guitarist. Then that song called The Fight made it onto our record because we were finishing recording our first album on Capitol. And then he said, well, okay, now it's my turn. So I went to SIR and on a lunch break, I got there right on time. I was walking towards the rehearsal room and they were like busting out of it. Gene, all of them like just walked past me, like practically knocking me over, just like I was like nothing. They almost trampled me on my way into the room and Paul was waiting for me. And, you know, there was a piano there on the side that had a cover on it. I'll never forget that because what did they need a piano for? But it was part of the rehearsal room. It was a big nine foot grand piano. So, and I'm a keyboardist. So we went and we pulled the top of it off so I could play the keys. We sat there and he sat next to me and I started playing him these chords and the verse melody. I had a little bit of a start tonight. I won't give it all to you. I had that. That was going to be a Desmond Charlie Rouge song. Then we joined into the song and then it became, I was made for you. You were made for me. Then in the studio, he developed it into this Motown thing. I was made for loving you baby which was really based on his love for Motown like standing in the shadow of love right right and so oh, it, I hear it we, now. We, we never thought of it as disco we thought of it as Motown it was a dance beat it wasn't a disco beat it was like four on the floor and it was like plowing aggressively forward we made an innovation we put a dance beat with rock guitars exactly. no one had ever done that before it but, changed the course of popular music totally totally absolutely and you know it's so funny that kiss fans draw the line with that song some love it some hate it some's like oh that's when kiss jumped the shark and then some people absolutely love it and it's played all the time and it never leaves the set list and it's always a huge hit and everybody sings along it's just well, funny it's, it's to date their biggest song globally oh yeah absolutely for sure i mean obviously the success is undeniable but but how do you feel about it being like that kind of divisive song that people love to hate or they're kind of like, oh, I, I love that song secretly, but, you know, I'm afraid to say I like it. Like, well, how do you feel about I that? I don't care about that stuff. The fact mm -hmm. is that Gene didn't like it and he made a thing about it. Yeah. So that he'd have something to say. He was like standing up for the old Kiss, you know, like whatever. <laughs> and it was like off brand. It wasn't like the Kiss sound that he could understand or like. But because Paul always has loved soul music, he even made his own album. Yeah, Soul, soul Station. Style. Yeah. So I read somewhere some professors saying that unless a music has some kind of roots in soul music, it can't make it. So if you look at Bon Jovi with the Motown y bass line, da, 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 all right. that kind of stuff, it was like the same thing. But with the heavy rock guitars, they weren't so bluesy, you know, the, the melodies. Which, they were more, you know, like straight ahead. Sure. Now, which of your songs had the hardest birth? Which was the hardest one to pull out that had huge success, but it was really hard to pull out? Usually the losers that are hard to write. Oh, really? <laughs> You know. Yeah, well, let me the, let me ask you. You know, the songs, you know, because you have to work so hard to try to make something out of maybe right. an idea that didn't have legs. I've worked really hard on different things for different reasons, but having writer's block or things like that, that never has been my problem. What would you say was the one that came out the fastest? Fastest? Yeah, like that just, um, like a, a hit song that just came flying out. Like, oh my God, I can't believe we finished that. Well, maybe my first session with Joan Jett where we wrote, I Hate Myself for Loving You. I mean, that one was like instant. Wow. And how you was know, she to work with? Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, she's just a doll and she's so serious and she's 
meticulous. You yeah. know, I mean, she's meticulous about everything. Yeah. She's a Virgo. You'd think with her image that she was like some kind of rock and roll mess. Right, right. She's no, the she's complete not. complete yeah. opposite yeah. of that. She walks in, she's like, looks beautiful and perfect. Her yep. makeup and the things she ties around her wrists are like her badges of honor. And, you know, <laughs> and she always like smelled amazing. Like she just like was just fantastic. And when she'd write out lyrics, if she made a mistake on the page, she'd tear it out and start over again. <laughs> so that when she walked out, she had like a perfect penmanship also. Wow. Beautiful penmanship. It was not what I expected. That's awesome. You know? Very professional. Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Was there ever a song that you're like, this is going to be a huge hit, and then it just sank without a trace, and you were like, what happened? Well, I had high hopes for a song called You Want to Make a Memory that I co-wrote with John, and Richie actually joined the song later in the studio. That did pretty Um, decent, though. That's a good song. Yeah, that's a great song. But I was never happy with the production because the way they decided to do it at that time was very, like, understated, almost like... U two ish or something. Yeah, ex- it almost just, like a with or without you. It, it didn't feel aggressive or big dramatic song that I'd hoped it would be. Right, that's you know? true. They slowed it and down. So you know. you know that was one that I was like, you know, gosh, you know, I I really thought that was like could be like the biggest song in the world, but it just didn't have the energy for that. It's very very like linear, and, and that's what they were into at that moment. What song superseded your expectations? Living on a prayer. Oh, really? You never oh, saw... Oh, my God. That's an anthem. I mean, it's... Theater. It was magic, you know. No one knew the potential that that was going to have, but also, musically, when it all came together, they just did everything right. Do you ever have someone fight over one of your songs, like two bands wanting one of your songs and bidding over it or fighting over it? No, not really, but when I went to play John, I Hate Myself for Loving You, he looked at me and he goes... Fuck you. And he, like, walked away. <laughs> he was mad you didn't give it to him? <laughs> yeah. I said, but I wrote it with her. It wasn't like I could have pulled the hook. Right, 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 right. He just kept walking. Oh, that's funny. You know? I think he liked it too much. <laughs> <laughs> so now, before you go to write with a band, do you do a lot of research on them, try to get their vibe and, and what they're all about before you go into a writing session? No, not too much. Maybe like a little snippet. And okay. Then, oh, I get it. You okay. Know, boom. Like I instantly get it. But the fact is that I am a person, I'm in the moment. And so, like, I walk in cold. I mean, except for, like, a title once in a while, like, You Give Love a Bad Name. I literally had it written on right. a piece of paper in my back pocket. But usually I'm wanting to know where they're at now. Yeah. Because, I mean, it, there's a story in my book about me and Eric Bazilian meeting uh-huh. because he had written a song called One of Us. He's the lead singer in the Hooters. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Gave it so, to Joan Osborne. Yeah. That song he solely wrote. Joan mm-hmm. Osborne, right? Right, exactly. This is what the critics do. It was one of the biggest songs in the world. They criticized her because she wasn't a co-writer on it. Right. So she goes and does this worldwide tour and won't perform it. Oh, my show. God. That's crazy. Her only claim to fame. Wow. Because she didn't co-write it. That's incredible. That's okay. what I was I, told. Ne- I never understand why some artists just won't perform, like, the song or one of the songs yeah. they're known for. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's, true. it's rebellion. It's like, I don't want to be pegged on that or, you know, this crazy stuff. It's like they're fueled by their ambition and their insecurity. Right. You know, so it's like you never know where that roulette wheel is going to land. <laughs> is there any collaborations that you wish would have happened that never happened? Yeah, I mean, George Michael sounds uh-huh. funny, but I met him at these Korean baths. Oh, you okay. know, it was the night before the Grammys where I was up for like three Grammys for Live and Love You the Loca. Right. You know, Song of the Year, Record of the Year, sure. something else of the year. And we lost it all to Santana. And so did the Backstreet Boys with Millennium. I mean, they had like masterpiece album. Yeah. And Clive Davis made sure that it was like a sweep for Santana. <laughs> for that. Nobody campaigned or tried as hard as Clive Davis to win. Like he won 16 Grammys. Yeah, that was crazy. insane. Yeah, for sure. And killed us, right? That's why every time I run into Rob Thomas, I just say, hey, you Grammy killer. <laughs> 
So I walk in the shower, and this guy's like there, and it's just like a two-person, like, cubby shower, right? Right. And I don't think I ever saw a hairier person ever, <laughs> you know, because he's Greek, right? Right, exactly. You know, so all of a sudden, like, like he looks at me, and I go, hello, and he goes, ooh, hello, you know, kind of like, don't look at me, right? you know, kind of thing. And I said, hi, I'm Desmond Child. Oh, Desmond Child, so he knew my name. Yeah. So we went back and forth to the plunge pool, and, you know, da 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 and we made friends. So right. I invited him to my win or lose Grammy party the next night. Okay. So it was the lose part of the party. <laughs> and he showed up. So he was there all night. Wow. And so I had hoped that I could co-write with him. Mm. And I felt like, you know, that we were like kindred spirits. Like, sure. First of all, I love anything about Britpop of the 80s because I wasn't making that kind of music. It right. was something I coveted that I wanted so bad. Okay. Tears for Fears, Duran Duran, Pet Shop Boys, Depeche Mode. Those are my idols. I love that. And Boy George, I did get to write with him once, but George Michael and also Michael Hutchins from In Excess. Mm -hmm. You know, I ended up writing with In Excess after he was gone. Oh, okay. You know, a song called Afterglow, which was about Michael, right. you know, like living in his afterglow, right? Exactly. So, you know, I tried reaching out and I couldn't hook up with him. And that was really painful yeah. for me, especially when he was gone. You know, it was like, oh, I, there went my chance. Yeah, you know, it was like, exactly. Wow. Exactly. But I did do a song of his in a kind of tribute show that was here in Nashville. It was like a benefit because Adele had done his song called Fast Love in this kind of slow way. And so I did my own version like that. Nice. Nice. Very, very moving, yeah. And I know in your book, you talk about working with Barbara Streisand. How was she to work with? She was amazing. Yeah. Like, she's just so intense, and she's such an intellect. Oh, yeah. High energy. I mean, she's a true artist, mm -hmm. and she's very, very demanding, you know, and very serious about her work. Right. And I had written a song for her, a solely written mm -hmm. song called Lady Liberty. And in fact, there's a terrific YouTube lyric video that she and I produced together. Beautiful. Of the song. It's a tribute to all the most important women in American history, including Lady Liberty, but all these others as well. I had tried many times to pitch songs to her, but I never hit the nail on the head because I just didn't really understand what the demands were to write a song for her voice. And so her executive music supervisor, Jay Landers, said, would you like to write a song for her? I said, okay, well, let's spend a day together listening to the highlights of her career. So he started playing me all these songs, and then I started feeling the jumps in her voice and the vowel sounds that make her voice sound money. Right. You know? Yeah. And it was there that I just sat down at the piano, and I remembered... My first memory of her was when I was 15, and she was in Funny Girl in a movie, right? Uh -huh. And then midway through the movie, she's like singing a song called Don't Rain on My Parade. Uh -huh. And she's on a tugboat in the Hudson. And all of a sudden, she's standing there and she has flowers in her hand, like up. And then all of a sudden, the Statue of Liberty is behind her holding the torch. And at one point, they kind of become one. And so that was like an aha moment for me. I said, Lady Liberty. Wow. You know, so I wrote this tribute to Lady Liberty. And it was totally went with her sentence. Sentiments, and I wrote it, you know, with all those jumps. And I also set it like a half step higher than all the songs she had sung, you know, for the past 10 years. Sure. Because it was like a high C, like limit for full voice. Were you most starstruck with her? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The most. And Laura Nero, of course. Okay. You know, okay. my idol, my all time idol. I <laughs> named my son after her. Oh. Nero. And he's like, it... why did you name me after a lesbian folk singer? <laughs> I said, because Dylan was taken. <laughs> <laughs> so now, where do you stand with someone like Diane Warren and Holly Knight? You seem like you have a similar place in life in the sense that you all have these incredible catalog of hit songs and you come in and work with legendary performers and make them even better. Do you guys know each other? I know you mentioned Diane in the book. How would you describe your relationship? Are you competitive? Are you friendly? We're like brother and sister. Okay. And we've had our fights and you know all that kind of stuff this but, is you you, you know, and diane the, yeah me and diane okay yeah. yeah i mean like our relationship is like we're soulmates I okay mean, just are i mean we text each other all the time okay usually dirty jokes and stuff like that and <laughs> okay. gossip. and oh as soon as somebody dies you know i get the text from her <laughs> okay. oh, so and so died you know right right like she's really on top of the obituary that's incredible <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like another one bites the dust oh you know? lord we're very close but we are rivals 
But she went a different direction. She went into movie songs. I had a whole other thing because she's not a collaborator. Okay. She solely writes her songs. Right. Very rarely will she collaborate. We have totally different approaches. She writes from her own imagination. Uh huh. Like, you know, she's not somebody that's been in relationships and all that, but she writes the most like heartfelt romantic songs. She creates it inside herself and that's her belonging inside of her heart, right? Right. But I write tailored, made to tell the story of the artist that I'm working with. Sure. So we have completely opposite things. Like she'll write a song and if it suits you, they sing it. Like Tara Smith saying, I don't want to miss a thing. Right. They didn't go write that. No, not at all. Their biggest song, they never wrote it. No, they it's know. A, it's incredible. And that one doesn't leave their set because if they don't sing no. that song, there's a problem. I know. <laughs> I know. You know, so she and I get along great. We haven't co-written in a really long time. The last song we wrote is called The Touch, which we wrote for Ricky Martin. I think that was on Sound Loaded. Yeah, that's a great and song. And then, you know, she went her own way, you know, like, and does done fabulously. Sure. And, you know, I did something different. I'm married. I have children. I moved to Nashville to raise our children. I was not, like, in the game <clears throat> like her. Right. You know? Exactly. And I'm still doing stuff, and I still have hits by accident, like Ava Max's song, Kings and Queens. Okay. And yeah. I write a lot with Rock Mafia, and we had a hit with Zed okay. called Beautiful Now. Nice. It's an EDM song. Beautiful. And we had a hit, not a hit, but like a popular song with Selena Gomez called Love Will Remember. Cool. And, you know, we have a cool song coming up with a new artist now that we've been sitting on that song for like eight years, and now I finally found the perfect home, so... It's those things, you know, you never know. You know, if a song's really great, it can still work. Absolutely. You, just, you know, change the synth sound and you're there, you know. Would change you... the drum sound and you're golden. And how would you describe your ear in the sense that you have an incredible talent to make something commercial, to make it digestible, to make it fun. You can almost feel that's the Desmond part of the song. How would you describe your ability to pull out commercial hooks? Well, I mean, it's my taste. It's just your it's taste. like if I started thinking, oh, i got to write a hit, right. I, you know, I'd just die. No, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, like, let's think about how to ride a bicycle. If you think about it too much, you just fall off. Right. That's you true. just go. Right. And, you know, I came from very poor circumstances, and I'm also Latin, and I'm also gay. Okay. So my whole life is a trajectory upwards. Okay. So my music goes upwards. The songs modulate upwards. The melodies reach upwards. That's what has, I think, helped me to, you know, continue working, is that these songs are have hope. Yeah. Because hope is an upward feeling. Sure, sure. So, you know, I create in hope. Exactly. And are you still in touch with John and Richie? Very much so. Separately, yes. Separately. Okay. And do you think those two will come together again? I have no idea. No? You know, I would love it. Yeah. And so would every Bon Jovi fan in the entire world. Right. But, you know, sometimes people grow apart. You know, it's like asking two people that were happily married that then got divorced. It's like... Why don't you guys get back together again? It's like, <laughs> what? Yeah, I guess so. I guess it's a tricky thing. That's a tough sell. Yeah, that's a tough sell. I mean, I'm a huge Bon Jovi fan, but I feel like it's not Bon Jovi without Richie. There's a missing piece there. You know, he's so lucrative to their sound, not only guitar-wise, but writing and also vocally. What do you yeah, think? His presence, you know, he's a star unto himself. Yeah. So he helps to add to the sparkle. Yeah, sure. But, you know, it's like they were together a long time. Yeah, yeah. You know, they did a lot of tours. It wears people out. It does. It does. It takes... You it know, takes... people have different emotional constitutions. Absolutely. So now, if, if you look at Kiss, you look at Aerosmith, you look at Bon Jovi, and all the different bands that you've worked with, was it a similar vibe, or was it a very different with each one of them? Every situation is different unto itself. Even from album to album, you go into the room, and it's not the same, you know? Right. It's like people have changed. All of a sudden, the wife that person was with is no longer around and right. now you're meeting the girlfriend right yeah <laughs> different vibe that yeah. brings out something else in them sure you know, it's like but the thing is if you stay with the now always stay with the now yeah not what was right or anything like that then you have a chance to create something fresh sure so that's the way I do it. I, you know, my book actually, you know, was hard to write for seven years because it was very difficult to look backwards for me. I can imagine. I yeah. want to look forward and up. Right. 
I call, you know, my book is sort of like, it took me seven years, I call it the seven-year jailhouse confession. <laughs> <laughs> it's a reckoning yeah. of a lot of the wrong turns I did. Thank God, you know, I made some good choices. For sure. I'm happily married and have wonderful children and continue to be creative. And I have lots of dreams going forward, I'm working on a Broadway show called Cuba Libre. And it's a true story of my family before and after the Cuban Revolution set in Havana in the late 50s and early 60s. And I've been working on that since 2005. Wow. Uh, it's been, you know, a real journey and had a lot of delays and COVID and yeah. this and that. But Broadway musicals are like collaborative. Oh, yeah. You can't do them alone. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. you have to wait until all the people and all the pieces are lined up. Yep. So we're getting ready to do another workshop first week of December in New York. And wow. then there'll be backers auditions and hopefully we'll get a regional theater. And we have a great new director, Adrian Campbell Holt. Wow. And we have a wonderful young producer, Joe. Monda. And my collaborators, Jeffrey Hatcher, wrote the book, and me and David Sigerson composed the songs. We just don't think about time. We just are doing whatever is right for the project. Of course. Well, the book is Living on a Prayer, Big Songs, Big Life from Desmond Child. So worth reading. Desmond, thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate not only your wonderful book, but your incredible decades of contributions to the music scene. Oh, thank you for saying so. Folks should follow me at Desmond.Child. There they can find out more about me. And, you know, I have a skincare line called Vita Loca Skin Life. And I have lots of projects and things coming out. So it's all there. I never cease announcing my great deeds. Whoa! How about that for rock video music fans? Live all day, all night. You know what you need only right here on Check us out on Facebook at Dave and Dave Unchained, a Van Halen podcast, on Twitter at DD Unchained, on Instagram at DD Unchained Podcast, and you can email us at DD Unchained Podcast at gmail.com. Dave. So, hey, it makes me 
time tonight. Before we get the 
latest thing on the move here, I want to tell you about some fools I know about. Is there anybody here tonight who likes to play a card game now and then? Yeah, I know there's a couple. Now, my pal Alex here on Heavy Artillery and I, we like to play a little card game now and then. Just the other week, we sat down to a quick game of baseball poker with a couple of dudes. And about halfway through the bottle, we took those guys for $85. The game was over. And one of the dudes jumped up, and he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, Hey, man, you took all our money. I said, that's right. And his pal was pretty bad, right? And he stood up, and he was twice as big. And he looked me straight in the eye and said, You took all our money, and we're going to take it on back. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I said, you don't want to try and take that money on back. Because I'm going to have to get in and go into my bedroom and wake up Joe. I said, you don't want me to go wake up Joe because Joe's pretty bad. Well, he must have thought he was even better because he looked me straight in the eye and he said, you go ahead and you wake up Joe. I said, all right. I said, all right. And I got up from the table real slow. And I turned around and walked into my bedroom real slow. And I came out with my shotgun and I said, motherfucker, this is Joe. So what are we gonna do, yeah? We're gonna send you out a little card game buggy. I'm singing about our fools. Ow! Dig it. My teachers all gave up on me. Cause I'm a comic book product of too much TV. If I don't decide to make you a grown-up scene Then I drink a little much for age 16 All the things I did And they put me on their bed The way you treat me, boy, is so so 